Mail Order Bride of Chance and Love. Written by Etta Foster and published by Starfall Publications. All formats available on our website. Enjoy. Chapter 1 The Great Plains passed by beyond the train's window. He stared through the glass, mesmerized by the long grass waving under the almost constant wind. Occasionally, herds of grazing buffalo, or an antelope sentinel standing atop a small knoll, watching for any threats to the herd, caught his attention. Ronald Hawthorne rubbed his face wearily, blinking, wishing he could sleep. However, the train's constant rocking motion wasn't exactly conducive to sleep. At most, he could doze off. Leaning his cheek on his fist, his elbow lodged against the train's metal skin, he closed his eyes. Where are you headed? Ronald lifted his face towards the voice. An elderly gentleman had taken the empty seat across the aisle from him and now gazed at him with bright eyes and a gap-toothed grin. Mayhew, Kansas, Ronald replied, uncertain if he wanted to have a conversation at that moment. I heard it at town. The old man nodded wisely, still beaming. Nice place. You got folks there? I have a ranch just outside the town, Ronald told him. I went to Iowa to visit my brother. He is not well. He's very ill, in fact, and I don't expect him to live much longer, I'm afraid. Yep, good to visit folks afore they pass. Yep, I'm headed for Denver myself. You have family in Denver? Ronald asked, wishing this old fellow could find someone else to chat with. Yep, gonna live with my daughter and her kin. Got's three little kids, noisy critters, them three, but I'm their granddad. I have a son. Ronald said, smiling a little. He's eight now, getting tall for his age. Kids do dat. Your wife wham while you're gone. A pang of loneliness and grief struck his heart, and Ronald's smile faded. No, my younger sister is. My wife died about eight months ago. Sorry to hear dat. I lost my wife a few years back. She were a hard woman, she were. All is complaining. Never happy. That's too bad, Ronald answered, thinking of Helen. My wife was kind, generous to a fault, sweet-natured. She loved to laugh. How'd she pass? Ronald wished he hadn't asked that question, but he supposed it was inevitable. People and their curious natures always seemed to want the lurid details. Just thinking about Helen brought back the pain of losing her, the tearing sense of loss, as though a part of him had been ripped from his chest. A great emptiness consumed him now, a terrible void he suspected could never be filled again. Thank God I have David, for without him, I'd have no reason to live. Son? He had almost forgotten the old man and his question. Without looking at him, Ronald replied, She died of influenza. The town doctor couldn't do anything for her. As though sensing he had touched something he shouldn't have, the old man said, genuinely apologetic, I'm right sorry to hear that, son. It seems that the good folks die afore they should, and the bad oons linger like a skunk's stink. His inelegant analogy shocked a short laugh from Ronald. Yeah, I guess that's true enough. I ain't gonna say be grateful for the time you had with her, son, the old man said, nodding his gray head as though about to drop great pearls of wisdom. Dat be right near impossible. But I will say this. Don't shut your heart up too tight now. You never know what might want in, you hear? Ronald glanced absently out the window at the passing prairie and the occasional clump of scrawny trees that seemed to sprout like weeds in a garden. A careless bird flew too close to his window, and the gusts of wind from the train's passing tossed its beak over tail feathers. I don't know if I can do that. I can't risk falling in love, only to lose them again. But he replied, I'll try. That's the best anybody can ask of ye, the fellow said. There be plenty of good women folks out there, son, and you be too young to live the rest of your life by yourself. I have my son. Yep, you do. Growing youngsters need a ma. Keeps him on the straight and narrow. Feeling as though the old man was pushing him to marry the first woman he tripped over, he started to grow annoyed. I'd rather you just minded your own business and kept your opinion to yourself. David will grow up just fine, even without a mother. He has me. Seeking a change of topic, he asked, keeping his voice slightly curious to mask his irritation. 
How many children do you have? Just a one, the fellow replied. There was a boy once. He died. Feeling ashamed of his annoyance, for Ronald couldn't imagine losing David, he said, I'm so sorry, and meant it. My boy is all that's keeping me on this earth. I live only to see him grow up and become a man. Nothing else matters. It were a long time ago. Ronald eyed the old man surreptitiously. A single tear tracked down his lined and weathered face, and his lips trembled as though he was fighting against more leaking from his eyes. Averting his gaze to give him some semblance of privacy, Ronald wondered at the sheer depths of grief. Some wounds never heal, no matter how old you get. Will I still be mourning Helen as deeply when I get to his age? Thinking of that yawning void within him, Ronald didn't think he could survive another 50 years enduring its presence. I barely got through the last eight months. What's dat, son? Ronald tried to smile, observing that the old man's moment of vulnerability had passed, and he once again wore his previous expression of cheerful curiosity. Sorry, just talking to myself. That's a sign of senility, he cackled. Maybe. Ronald smiled slightly. It's a habit of mine. Helps keep my thoughts in order. Then I spec that might be a good thing. Leaning his head back against the seat, Ronald closed his eyes. I'll be home by tomorrow. I'll be able to see David and Maggie and sleep in my own bed. His thoughts ranged to his brother, Thomas, whom he might never see again. Being only a few years older than Ronald, like Helen, Tom was too young to die. But his illness had no cure. Loud voices interrupted his thoughts, and he turned to glance around the seat. They came from the car behind him, and it certainly sounded like an argument. The old gent also turned to look, his half-smile gone and a quizzical expression in its place. Somebody don't like somebody else, he cackled again. I reckon not. Closing his eyes again, Ronald hoped both the noise and the old man would fall silent so he might manage to doze off. His body craved sleep desperately, and even if he couldn't slumber soundly, the light naps he did achieve helped. The argument continued, even if the gent did not. Tuning it out as best he could, Ronald once again thought about Tom. His body wasted from the sickness that ate him alive, Tom still maintained a hopeful outlook. I'll beat it, he had told Ronald. Just see if I don't. I hope you do. I already lost Helen. I don't want to lose you as well. But despite his positive attitude, Ronald knew Tom was fighting a battle he would eventually lose. That was why Ronald had taken valuable time away from the ranch and David to travel the hundreds of miles to Iowa to see him. Like the old man said, it was good to see Tom before he died, before it was too late. Chapter 2 How can I marry a man I have never seen? Slumping in her seat aboard the rocking, vibrating train, Jennifer felt the old, familiar fears creep over her again. They were never far away always hovering nearby like a thunderstorm just over the horizon. In moments of weakness, like this one, they crashed over her, swamping her in her misery. All I want is to be happy. Why does that seem like too much to ask from life? She'd lost everything, her family, her home, and all but the few dollars she had in her small handbag. Jennifer fingered the locket on the fine chain that hung around her neck. All that was left of her mother. Death was impartial when it came calling. Gazing through the window beside her, she again wondered what he was like. The man in Utah I am on my way to marry. Her mind worried at it constantly, like a squirrel frantically digging for the nut it had buried. Not for the first time, Jennifer wondered if she had made the right choice or not. It seemed no matter what decision she made, it would always be the wrong one. Loud voices brought her head up, and she listened for a moment, thinking about how ironic it was that a husband and his wife chose that moment to have an argument. None of my business. Dipping back into her thoughts of regret, Jennifer considered the emptiness of her future with despair. How can I ever be happy? The train car's door rattled open behind her, startling her from her thoughts. It banged closed again, and a young woman sank into the seat beside her. 
Not liking the intrusion, as there were plenty of other seats she could have taken, Jennifer opened her mouth to ask her to leave. I'm so sorry, the girl gasped, for surely she hadn't reached her 18th birthday yet. I need to get away from him. He won't bother me if he sees me with you. The girl, thin to the point of emaciation, had dark hair streaming out from under her plain bonnet and wore a torn and stained gown much too big for her. Jennifer met her large, dark eyes in a small, pinched face and smiled slightly. Is it your husband, she asked. Oh, no, she answered, looking around the edge of the seat over her shoulder at the door. I'm traveling with him, but he ain't my husband. Then why was he yelling, Jennifer asked, her smile fading. I am assuming it was him. The girl gazed down at her fingers entwined in her lap. He's a bad man, she muttered. I don't like him, but I got no choice. I got no money, nothing. I think we all have a choice, Jennifer replied slowly. We just don't always make the right ones. It don't matter. He made me a promise, and I believed him. I guess that makes me stupid. No, it doesn't. If he lied, it's on him, not you. What is your name? Gloria Anderson, ma'am. Jennifer held out her hand to shake. I'm Jennifer Johnstone. A pleasure to meet you, Gloria. You too, Jennifer. Gloria smiled, and when she did, it lit up her face and made it beautiful. Now why would you end up with a bad man, Gloria? Gloria twisted her fingers together again. His name is Christian Bates. He promised to take me west, help me find a husband, make me a respectable woman. I got no family, Jennifer. She grimaced. I'm an orphan, you see. Yes, Jennifer replied. I am too. I just lost my grandfather, my only remaining family. I don't have anything or any money either. It's hard, ain't it? Yes, it's never easy for a woman to be alone in the world. Well, Christian made a promise, but he ain't keeping it, Gloria explained. He told me I had to steal for him. He turned me into a thief. As Jennifer gaped, Gloria went on, her pale skin turning red with anger and fear. I told him, no, I don't want to be no thief or steal from good, honest folks. He told me I owed him. I had no choice. Is that when he got so angry? Yeah, told me to steal or else. All I wanted was a good man to marry, maybe have some kids. Jennifer, I ain't no thief. Stealing is wrong, certainly, Jennifer told her. How can he expect you to do that? What does it get him? He said I had a face people trusted, Gloria replied, smiling. But he would take most everything, said he'd make sure I was taken care of. Jennifer snorted. Of course he would. Take what you stole, then throw you a few crusts now and then. Why did he have to do that? Gloria sounded close to tearing up. All I wanted was to find me a husband and be happy. That's all I want too, Gloria. Jennifer leaned her head back against the seat and stared out the window. I foolishly squandered what little money I had, she murmured. After my grandfather died, I had nowhere to go, no one to turn to. So, what did you do? I answered an advert for a mail-order bride, Gloria gasped. You, how does that work? Well, when a man needs a bride to marry, Jennifer replied, turning her face back to the girl, he lets a certain agency know about it. The agency then helps him find a woman who needs to get married. So that's what I did. Now I'm on my way to Utah to marry a man, a stranger whom I've only got a few letters from. Then how do you know if he's going to treat you right, Gloria asked, clearly fascinated. He could be a terrible man who beats you bad. Or he could be the most wonderful man in the country. Jennifer smiled bitterly. Or something in between. You take your chances. If I had known about that, Gloria said, I'd never have joined Christian. I could have married a decent, righteous man already, and he'd be taking care of me. That is a possibility, Jennifer agreed. Maybe it's not too late, Gloria added eagerly. Maybe I can leave old Christian and find me a husband. Jennifer watched her thoughtfully. It's a scary thing to travel to a strange town and marry a man you've never met. I'm doing it, and I really don't want to. It frightens me, silly. Oh, that don't bother me none, Gloria proclaimed with a wave of her hand, as long as he takes care of me and don't cause me trouble. Are you serious? Jennifer stared in astonishment. How can you say that? There's more to being married than simply being cared for. 
My old man used to not take care of my ma and me, Gloria replied, nibbling her lower lip. Then they died, when I were just thirteen or so. Then I went to live with ma's sister, and her husband were not nice at all. He never hit me, though. My father never hit me, Jennifer told her thoughtfully. I suppose a husband has the right to discipline his wife, but I don't want to marry a man who will treat me badly. As long as I got a roof over my head and a full belly, I don't much care. A man's supposed to take care of his wife. Jennifer stared out the window again, thinking hard. Gloria, do you really want to be married? Oh, yes, ma'am. More than anything, she turned from the window. You're old enough to marry, right? Gloria's expression turned indignant. I am 19. Chuckling, Jennifer went on. You look like you are no more than 15. Oh, I never thought I looked that young, ma'am. Then I have a proposition for you, Gloria. Apropos what? You pretend you are me and go to Utah in my place. You marry the man I was supposed to. Gloria's dark eyes went round. Really? You would do that? For me? I would. But I have to be honest, Gloria. It is because the thought of marrying a stranger scares me. Then what will you do? Don't say you'll go with Christian. No, of course not. Jennifer laughed at the thought. But this way you are free of him and you get a husband. But what will you do? Gloria repeated. I'll get off the train in one of these towns, Jennifer mused. A nice town. Get a job at the local store or help a seamstress. I can sew really well. Then find a husband? Laughing, Jennifer nodded. Yes, I suppose, in time. Then let's do it. Gloria almost bounced in her seat like an excited child. Reaching into the satchel she carried onto the train with her, Jennifer pulled out the small packet of letters. Read these, she said, handing them to Gloria. His name is Jason Tuttle from Silver City, Utah. But Gloria... Ma'am? Gloria looked at her with adoration, near worship that immediately made Jennifer uncomfortable. Listen, you will have to tell him who you really are. You cannot, must not, start a new life on a lie. The young girl frowned, puzzled. Won't he be mad that I ain't Jennifer? He might be. But if you explain to him that we met on the train, I was scared, and you were not, he will forgive you, I'm sure. Gloria stared down at the letters, then hugged them to her small bosom. I don't know how to thank you, Jennifer. Thank me by having a good and happy life. I will, Gloria answered. I promise. We may never see each other again, Jennifer mused. But perhaps we can write letters to one another. Gloria's face fell. I can't write very good but I'll try. I'll just want to know how you're doing, that's all. I don't care how... A man's deep and ugly voice suddenly spoke beside Gloria. What is going on here? Chapter 3 The elderly gentleman across the aisle had fallen asleep and Ronald eyed him with no little envy. At least it's quiet now. After the initial raised voices, he heard nothing else save the mild conversations of others in the car with him, and the steel wheels rolling on the tracks. He yawned, thinking he might try sleeping again, when suddenly the loud babble of voices started again. This time, many more were involved, and he distinctly heard the higher-pitched cries of a woman. Ronald glanced at the old man who snored on, his mouth open. The noise and commotion came from the car to the rear, where the doors to both cars were open. Ronald saw the conductor in his uniform hurry down the aisle past him and vanish into the press of people. Ronald caught a fast glimpse of it before the door slid shut. "'She's a thief, I tell you!' yelled a voice. "'I want her off this train right now!' Ronald heard that clearly above the rest of the confusion, and he pinched the bridge of his nose, closing his eyes. Mind your own business, Ron, he muttered. Just mind your own affairs. That reminder to himself lasted for only seconds. When he heard the woman's voice rise again in fear, he stood up before he truly could think about what he was doing. He pushed aside the door and crossed into the car, then paused to take in the almost surreal situation he saw before him. A slender woman in a blue-green print dress faced what seemed to Ron to be a mob of furious men. She appeared both terrified and angry, yet had enough backbone to stand her ground. 
Her blonde hair had come loose from its once careful coif, trailing down her neck, and instantly, Ronald felt his instinct to protect a woman kick in. Wading into the mixture, he planted himself beside her even as the conductor shouted, Calm down, everyone, just calm down, while holding his hands up. A Ronald met the lady's clear gray eyes briefly before turning his attention back to the mob. One man stood to the forefront, a tall fellow of middle years with deep-set brown eyes, a drooping mustache and dark hair under a cowboy hat. Calm down, I say, the conductor yelled again, and this time the babble faded down to angry mutters. Now what in tarnation is going on here, he demanded, turning to face the woman and Ronald, then the gathering of men in the aisle in between seats. The tall man pointed a furious finger. That woman there is a thief, he snapped. I want her off this train. Shouts and cries of, yeah, get her off now. We want no thieves on this train, erupted in the wagon. What exactly did she steal? Ronald asked, his soft question cutting through the anger. I didn't steal anything, the woman at his side insisted. He's lying. Even with three inches of space between them, Ronald felt her body shaking as though she was sick with a high fever. He glanced at her tight face, her desperate eyes. He knew she was telling the truth. How, he wasn't sure, but he saw none of the signs a liar could usually never hide. She stole something from me, the man declared. I caught her at it, and I got it back. But if she ain't tossed off this train, she'll be stealing again. What did she steal? Ronald asked again. That don't matter. Hooking his thumbs through his belt, Ronald took a step forward to stare the man in the eye. It matters to me, especially if you're accusing an innocent woman. She ain't innocent, he declared, then turned to stir up the small crowd. We don't want her on here with us, do we, boys? As the shouts escalated again, and the conductor tried again to calm them, Ronald glanced around the rest of the car. Several women in sunbonnets looked on, horrified, talking to one another. One, a very young girl who looked on the brink of starvation, cried. Tears rolled down her thin cheeks, and she didn't try to wipe them away. Helpless, the conductor turned to Ronald and the woman. I am sorry, ma'am, but you will have to get off at the next stop. Why? she cried. I did nothing wrong. I can't have a riot on this train, ma'am, he went on, sweating, his hands clasping and unclasping. There's a town coming up in Missouri. You can catch another train there. Look, Ronald said, his tone reasonable. I will take responsibility for her. Let her come with me to the next car and I will watch her. Not good enough, the mustached man shouted angrily. You go to sleep and then she's at it again. Stop the train and throw her off now. Ronald almost felt sorry for the conductor. Almost. The bald little man helplessly turned back, spreading his hands. The angry men behind him continually demanded he stop the train and shove her off, and that idiot didn't have the courage to stand up to them. Ronald's anger and disgust rose as he pointed his own finger an inch from the conductor's nose. You throw a helpless woman off this train into the wilderness, and there will be hell to pay for you. I'm sorry, the man pleaded, sweat trickling down his cheek. I can't do otherwise. There are too many of them. Ronald snorted. You're supposed to be responsible for all the lives on this train, Ronald snarled. Even hers. It's not that far to Petersburg, the conductor answered, his eyes flicking between Ron and the lady whose name Ron didn't know. She can get there in a few hours. Unless she is killed, you fool. Ronald glared at the mob. You are all cowards, every last one of you. You let one man stir you up into a frenzy over an item he got back and are willing to let this woman die because of it. The men, now silent, simply stared back at him with cold, unforgiving eyes. None displayed guilt or worry or remorse for their conduct. The leader pushed past Ronald to stride quickly toward the front of the train. Then he felt the light touch on his arm. Ronald swung toward the girl. It's all right, she said, her lips quivering. I'll get off. Maybe someone in this town will help me. No, ma'am, Ronald said, his fierce glare raking over the men and the conductor. If you get off this train, so will I. No, she protested. You mustn't. I am not about to permit a young woman to roam in the middle of nowhere on foot. 
Once we get to Petersburg, we will figure something out. The train lurched forward as it suddenly slowed, throwing the woman into Ronald. He caught her by the arms before she could send them both tumbling and felt her shaking. Thank you, she murmured as they regained their balance, and the train continued to slow down. Displaying more courage than many men Ronald knew, she shoved her way through the circle of men, most of whom glowered as she passed. She went to the crying girl, and the two spoke softly for a time. Ronald could not hear what they said to one another. Then they embraced. The dark-haired girl clung and cried, her tears wetting the blonde's shoulder. The woman detangled herself from the girl, still speaking softly, then kissed her brow. With grace and courage, she walked back amid the men, her head high. She has more guts than the lot of you, Ronald told them. You should mind your own business, mister, one snapped. Maybe we should make you. After the woman reached his side, Ronald ambled toward the speaker, his thumb still hooked into his belt. You think you want to try, boy, he asked, his voice deadly soft. The fellow took a step back, stumbled over the boot of one of his fellow mobsters, and almost fell into a woman's lap. His eyes wide, he quickly shook his head. Ronald stared into the eyes of the others, unblinking. You all think I should be minding my own business? We want no more trouble from you or her, another man in a bowler hat said. Just get her off the train, sir. I will, Ronald replied, his tone still dangerously quiet. But at least I know I'll be able to look at myself in the mirror when I shave, and I really hope none of you are able to sleep again knowing what you're doing. Turning his back on them, Ronald gently took the woman by the arm and led her across to the car in front. The train slowly rolled to a halt as Ronald glanced through the windows to see the long, waving grass. The old man still slept, oblivious to the commotion, and the train stopped. Silently wishing the old man well, Ronald halted as the conductor swung open the door. It's a fair jump to the ground, he said apologetically. What about our things? The woman asked, composed, and Ronald admired her for it. We'll open the hatches and fetch your belongings, ma'am, he answered as a porter also arrived. Ronald jumped down from the car to the soft, grassy earth below, then reached up to catch the lady around her small waist. As he lifted her, she felt no heavier than a teenage girl, and he set her on her feet in the long grass. The porter also hopped down and ambled along the side of the train to the hatches. It took about 30 minutes to find their luggage, while faces stared through the windows above them. Ronald glanced around at the Missouri prairie, listening to the light wind whisper through the grass. The air was warm, but not excessively hot, as the fierce summer heat had not yet fully arrived. The town's about four miles that way, the conductor said, pointing. You'll make it all right. And you couldn't have let us remain on board a whole four miles, Ronald replied, bitter. You're as much a coward as they are. The conductor flushed, then retreated inside. Ronald watched the mob leader smirk with enjoyment from an open window and suddenly wished he could smash that triumphant grin right off his face. Turning his back, he ambled to the woman, who looked out over the vast, empty prairie with her arms folded across her stomach. What is your name, he asked. She glanced up at him. Jennifer Johnstone. I'm Ronald Hawthorne. He grinned as she held out her hand for him to shake. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Hawthorne. As long as we're in this fix together, you may as well call me Ron. Then I'm Jennifer. Behind them, the train started to roll, its whistle piercing the almost silent air. The wheels chugged, but Ronald didn't turn to watch as the cars and the faces in the windows picked up speed. Where are you from, Jennifer? Northern Iowa, you? I have a ranch outside Mayhew, Kansas, he replied as the last wash of wind from the train's passing ran through his hair. I went to Iowa to pay a visit to my brother there. I was heading home. I was going to Utah she said, her eyes on the very distant horizon, to start a new life. That takes guts, Jennifer, he said, gazing down at the pile of bags and canvas satchels. Not many can do it. I had to. My grandfather died, and he was my only family. She chuckled suddenly. Starting over seemed like a good idea at the time. Now I'm not so sure. Well, Jennifer, Ronald said lightly, it's time to see what lies beyond that hill over yonder. Chapter 4 
Ron looped his belt through several of the bags, buckled it, then slung the entire mass over his left shoulder. You must be very strong to carry all that, Jennifer said, stunned. He grinned as he bent to pick up another in his right hand. Can you handle that one? She eyed the small satchel that held the mementos from her past life and a few other oddments. Now you're making me feel really guilty. It's only a few miles, he said, starting to walk along the tracks. Picking it up, she quickly caught up to him. Here you are, joining me in exile and carrying my luggage. A few of them are mine, you know. Walking on the wooden trestles and the gravel between them wasn't difficult, but Jennifer wasn't used to walking even one mile, much less four. Gritting her teeth, she strode quickly beside Ron. I will not become a burden to you, Ron, she said. Now you let me worry about that, he replied. So what did you steal? Jennifer gaped. Nothing I told you. You mean you don't believe me? I believe you didn't steal the man's pocket watch, Ron answered, cocking his bright blue eye at her. But you took something from him. Jennifer nodded, fascinated by his insight. I took his would-be thief. His what? His name is Christian Bates, she began, trudging beside him. He promised to find a husband for a young woman named Gloria Anderson. Then he told her she had to thieve for him in payment of that service. Would that be the little crying gal? Yes. When I set Gloria onto a better path, basically I took her from him. Bates was furious. He started screaming at us, threatening us, then started telling the others that I had stolen from him. How did he stir them up so good? Ron asked, jerking his chin to toss his dark brown hair from his eyes. I don't know. I honestly don't. Within minutes, he had them convinced I was evil incarnate. Nothing she or I said in protest mattered. Had you not come along, they'd have thrown me out without stopping the train first. Smart men can be real stupid when they get into a lather, Ron commented. So this Bates fellow, he's a crooked one? From what little Gloria was able to tell me before he interrupted us, I believe he is a criminal, and had I not stopped her from going on with him, I think she would have come to a very bad end. Ron caught her eye. What will happen to her now you're not there to protect her? Before the mob got too riled, Jennifer answered, I did manage to get Gloria under the protection of another woman and her husband. They are going to a town near where she is headed, and they have agreed to look after her. That's a good thing you did, Jennifer, he remarked, giving her another boyish grin. And I'm pleased to have met you. Thanks. Jennifer felt a warm flush at his praise. I had no idea he was that evil. I honestly thought that if she stayed with me, he'd simply ignore her. Some folks are just born mean, Ron commented, giving her another glimpse of those pure blue eyes. Like a horse or a cow, though them critters are rare. Animals now, they aren't always born mean. People make them that way. But some people are born with the devil in them. So, tell me about you, Ron, she said. Clearly, you were not born with the devil in you. That brought a grin to his face. I'm just a plain rancher with a spread in Kansas, he replied, shifting the burden on his back more comfortably. I have a boy, David. He's eight, cute as a button, and wants to be a rancher like his old pa. I bet your wife is proud. Ron's expression, once warm and smiling, darkened instantly. Slightly alarmed, Jennifer wondered what it was she had said that brought that reaction. She was, he finally said, his voice tight. She died. I'm so sorry. It was the influenza that took her last year. The doctor did all he could, but she didn't have the strength to fight it. She passed on through the pearly gates. Who is with your son now? His lips turned up briefly. My younger sister, Maggie. After Helen died, she came to help me. A good woman. Jennifer stayed silent, thinking of the cycle of life and death and how many people pass through the pearly gates before their time. Young, old, it didn't seem to matter. Death came and there was no going back. More than an hour passed and Jennifer's feet grew painful blisters. She said nothing to Ron and grimly continued under the afternoon sky. Exhaustion tugged at her and her clothes clung damply to her skin as she sweated. I suppose it could be worse, she muttered. It could be high summer. Yep, it gets right hot in these parts in July and August. 
Gazing outward, she saw no sign of Petersburg ahead of them and tried not to despair. Need a rest, Jennifer? No, I could use a nice glass of cold water, though. I'm guessing we've covered two miles or more, he said. We'll get there soon. Another hour passed and structures appeared on the horizon. The sun started its descent into the west, blinding their eyes, as though in apology for the sun's behavior, the air cooled noticeably. The town's houses grew closer, and soon the train station itself came into view. We made it, Ron said with a grin, lowering the bags from his shoulder in order to toss them up onto the platform. Jennifer threw the one she carried up there. Now what, she asked. What will happen? You think I'm just going to abandon you? Ron asked, hopping up, then extending a hand down to assist her up. I would expect you to. He hauled her up to stand beside him. No way. We shall stay together until I get you to a safe place. This is a safe place, she said, gazing around at the dismal-looking town, the few riders on horses walking up the main street. We don't know that, he replied, shouldering his burden again. You got money? No. Well, then, you're not safe. Jennifer followed him to the station master's office and walked into the dim interior. The clerk behind the counter eyed them up and down with disapproval. His eyes spotted their bags on the floor. You're not from around here. No, sir. Ron put his hands flat on the counter. When is the next train for Mayhew, Kansas? The man sniffed in disdain, then inspected a schedule that lay behind the counter where Jennifer couldn't see it. Not for two more weeks. Two weeks? What are we to do now? She almost wailed, despairing. We can't stay here for two weeks. Hold your horses, Ron said, then turned away and picked up the bags again. We'll figure something out. Following him back out into the late afternoon sunlight, she stopped when he did and gazed over the sleepy town. We can't do much today, he said at last, looking down at her. I say we get rooms at the hotel, a decent dinner, and we'll come up with a plan in the morning. Shame filled her, and she felt a flush creep up her cheeks. I can't afford a hotel room. Nothing wrong with that, Jennifer, he said, his grin returning. I can. I don't know when I can pay you back. Who's saying you have to? Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Chapter 5 Witnessing the shame and defeat in her eyes, Ron tilted her chin up with his finger. Don't you be worrying about it, Jennifer, he said softly. I'm not going to abandon you because you don't have a dollar to your name. I told you I didn't want to be a burden to you, she replied, her voice hot. That means I don't want to be a financial one, too. He laughed, liking her tough spirit, her refusal to back down. If you're heading in that direction, I'll be sure to tell you. Deal? Deal. But Ron caught the flash of sullen temper in her eyes and knew she did not like to take anyone's charity. That's fine. I don't either. Leading the way into town, he looked up and down the main street, searching for a hotel. I'm not seeing a place to stay, are you? No, she replied. But there's a general store right there. Maybe we can ask if there is one. Sounds good to me. Ron led the way to the general store, which looked to be closing soon. No wagons or horses were tied up out front, and the shades over the big front window had been pulled down. Yet the door handle moved easily under his hand, and a bell at the top tinkled to announce their arrival. A bespectacled man stood behind the counter, and Ron immediately caught his glower, his expression of deep suspicion. Afternoon, Ron greeted him. Do you happen to have a hotel in this town? No, the proprietor replied shortly. Ron exchanged a long look with Jennifer, observing her fear. Well then, is there a place where folks might stay the night? We'll pay. No, in fact, we don't much like strangers in Petersburg. The man puffed his chest out self-importantly. Now, just move along. The next town is five miles that way. He pointed, then went back to his task of tidying shelves. That's not very hospitable of you, Ron remarked, keeping his temper reined in. Night's coming, and we have no transportation. Don't care. Drawing Jennifer aside, Ron pitched his voice low. Are you up for camping under the sky? As long as I can get off my feet, she answered, dazzling him with her smile. 
I saw a livery stable down yonder, Ron said, rubbing his chin. I'll head there and see about bargaining for a wagon and a team. You stay here and talk that old geezer into selling us supplies. That's going to cost a fortune, she protested, the fear creeping back into her eyes. Don't you worry about that, miss. We'll need blankets, good ones, as the nights will be cold. Food, pans to cook with, a coffee pot. You know what I'm getting at? Jennifer nodded. Go on. I hope they'll have a wagon and team to sell. Me too. Leaving the general store, Ron walked down the street toward the livery stable he had seen, praying under his breath for a miracle. The livery owner was in, and a tiny bit friendlier than the shop proprietor. He did have a wagon and a mule team he didn't mind selling, he said. Been meaning to sell it a while ago, he told Ron. Never got around to it. It looks rickety, but the axles and the wood are sound. After taking a good look at it, Ron agreed with his assessment. And the mules? Biggins, the man replied. Took them in when their owners skipped town without paying. Never had no use for them. They just eat their heads off. The big gray mules munched hay and gazed at Ron with huge doe eyes. What's your price? The man named a sum, and Ron immediately haggled him down to what he thought was reasonable. After paying for the wagon and team with the cash from his pocket, Ron hitched the mules to the shafts. The man helped, and as they worked, Ron asked, Why are folks so hateful to strangers? Too many come and don't pay what they owe, he replied. They cause trouble, break furniture, then skip out when the bill comes due. We aren't all like that. No, I can see that but this town has too many bad and long memories. Driving the mules back to the general store, Ron caught menacing glances from those few folks who had not yet got home. Shaking his head at the idiocy of being inhospitable, he wondered how they might like to be treated as an anathema if they had to travel to a distant town. Jennifer's face was tight with restrained fury by the time he entered the store again. The counter was now filled with the goods they would need to travel with, and the owner of the store still added other items. He walked closer cautiously, wondering what the man had done to get Jennifer all riled up. Can you think of anything else? She asked, her voice thick, her gray eyes snapping with suppressed rage. Yeah, Ron looked at the shop's owner. I'll need a rifle and the ammunition to go with it. The owner stopped and looked at him for a long moment. You got the money to pay for all this? Jennifer nodded. He's been at me, judging me, without knowing anything about me, or you, on and on, about how we'll run off without paying. Ron stared at the fellow. Mister, you ought not to be too quick to judge folks. I don't care about the past. It's done with. Now you ought to be really grateful that we are paying and are bringing you our business. Or maybe you'd rather we went elsewhere, like to the town down the road. We have transportation now. The man set his mouth in a thin line. Let me see your money. His anger rising at the veiled insult, Ron removed the cash from his pocket. Jennifer's eyes widened, but she said nothing. With a sharp nod, the proprietor escorted Ron to the rack of rifles. Take your pick. Ron selected a Winchester, examined it closely for faults, then walked back to set it on the counter. Ammo. After purchasing the goods that would see them on the road, Ron and Jennifer carried everything to the wagon out front. Darkness had crept in as they bought the things they needed to travel to Kansas. The air had grown noticeably colder. As they left the store for the final time, Ron heard the door lock behind them. He had me so angry, Jennifer said as he handed her up onto the wagon seat. He was so insulting. Ron walked around the mules to climb up to sit beside her, then picked up the Winchester. Yep, he replied as he loaded it, then set it on the floor at their feet. The livery stable man said strangers run out on their bills. How many strangers have come through here and paid for what they bought? Ron laughed as he slapped the reins on the mules' rumps, sending them into a brisk trot. I bet they don't bother to count those folks. Taking the road west... Ron listened to the coyotes yipping on the prairie, half expecting the sound to spook Jennifer. She turned her head toward the direction the sounds came from, but made no comment. Further away, a wolf howled and was answered by others. The coyotes instantly went silent. That noise don't worry you, he asked. Is it supposed to? He laughed. Nope. 
Wolves and coyotes are too afraid of people and shy to be dangerous to us. They're only deadly when cornered. I have no intention of cornering a wolf. Me neither. I'm looking for a camping place near water. Shout out if you see something like that. They found a chuckling stream about a mile on, and Ron steered the mules toward it. On the banks were groves of trees, plenty of deadwood lying beneath them for firewood. Do you mind collecting wood while I unhitch? he asked. Of course not, Jennifer answered, a smile in her voice. I'll do my share of the camp chores. By the time he had watered the mules and hobbled them to graze, Jennifer had accumulated a sizable pile of wood. She had also scraped out a fire pit and lined it with rocks from the creek. As Ron examined her work, she was busy unloading the boxes of food and blankets and setting them near the fire. What's for supper, he asked, grinning. How about a stew made from dried beef, carrots, and potatoes? I reckon I'll get the fire built so all that can happen. Within an hour, Ron sat on his blanket beside the fire watching Jennifer stir the stew as it bubbled in its pot, hung over the flickering flames. Smells great. Jennifer smiled, the fire lighting her face in orange and red. She had let her hair down from its once tidy pile on her head, and it flowed over her shoulders like a silken river. It's almost ready. I thought that for breakfast we'd have fried ham and potatoes. Don't mind if I do. The stew was as tasty as it smelled, and Ron helped himself to three bowls of it. Now if that don't hit the spot, he said, then gulped cold water from the creek. Not too bad, I guess, Jennifer replied, still working on her second helping. I'm not used to cooking outdoors. You're doing a fine job so far. Jennifer took the pot, the bowls, and the utensils to the stream to wash them, while Ron checked on the mules, then fed the fire with more chunks of wood. It's a clear night, he commented as she came back, gazing up at the brightly shining stars above. Might be a bit cold. Take that extra blanket and wrap up warm in it. I am getting cold, she admitted, then sat down and settled one around her shoulders. Lie down as close to the fire as you can, he said. I'll wake and keep it going through the night. Jennifer gazed across the flickering, dancing flames. To say thank you for all that you've done is not enough. I couldn't abide seeing a lady in trouble without offering to help, he replied, admiring her beautiful face, the sleek fall of her hair. You've gone above and beyond mere help, Ron. I don't mind. If I were to go all the way to Kansas with you, she began slowly, would there be employment opportunities for me there? Sure. Old man Thompson at the store has been begging for help. So is Mrs. Oldwood. She runs a place that makes dresses and such. She claims she needs a new set of eyes and hands. The stable fellow needs someone to muck stalls. Jennifer laughed. Then perhaps I will make Mayhew, Kansas my new home. Be darn glad to have you, Ron said with a grin. We aren't as rude to strangers as those folks back yonder. That's good. We'll be on the road a while, he said, his grin fading. It won't be easy, roughing it like this. As long as I have you to teach me, I'll be fine. A short while later, Jennifer rolled herself into both blankets, lying down with her head pillowed on her arm. Ron remained awake for another hour or so, feeding the fire and watching the stars in their courses overhead. Then he, too, covered himself with his blanket and soon fell asleep. After a hot breakfast in the chilly morning air, Ron and Jennifer continued on, traveling west. Of course, with nothing to do but talk to one another, Ron learned a great deal about Jennifer, as she did about him. And the more he learned about her, the more he liked her. She was kind, soft-hearted, quicker to smile and laugh than get angry. He liked that aspect of her, just as he admired her tough spirit. They passed the town that the general store's owner told them about without stopping, then made their destination the next one up the road. If this one has a hotel, he told her, we'll get rooms. I don't mind roughing it, she told him. Save the expense, he winked. And not give me the chance to spend the money I earn? Money should be saved, not squandered, she said primly, says the one who admitted to squandering. I learned my lesson, believe me. 
They arrived at the town of Westbrook, Missouri, near the border with Kansas, an hour before sunset. Ron drew the mules to a stop in front of the tall, white clapboard hotel and stared up at it. Let's see if these folks are more hospitable. It turned out they were happy to have a custom. We haven't had many travelers lately, said the woman at the counter with a cheerful smile. Two rooms, you said. Dinner will be served in an hour. A boy took charge of their mules and wagon, leaving Ron and Jennifer to examine the comfortable rooms. I like being greeted with a smile, Jennifer commented as they walked back down the stairs to the hall where dinner would be served. I'm thinking we should stay for a day or two, Ron said as they sat down at a cloth-covered table. I should send a wire to Maggie, let her know I'm still alive, and I heard someone mention a town dance. Of course, Jennifer looked aside at the mention of spending more money on her. Ron also liked that about her, and he knew it was not just an affectation. She truly worried about the money he spent. You shouldn't be spending money on a hotel, she said, her voice low. We should move on. I have an opportunity to take a beautiful woman to a dance, he grinned. I can't pass that up. Though he had known her for less than 36 hours, Ron felt he had known her for far longer. When he was with her, he felt less lonely, more like a young bachelor than a widower. The shadows over his heart moved back for a time and allowed the sun to shine again. He fully enjoyed her company, and no other woman he'd met since Helen died made him feel that young again. Jennifer wore her best dress to the dance the town put on the following night, smiling, laughing, utterly beautiful. Ron took her in his arms to dance, knowing he was the envy of most of the men there. Jennifer danced with no one except him. You make me feel so free, he murmured, his face close to hers, his eyes looking into hers. So young, as though I've been born again. You make me feel safe, Ron, she whispered, her arms around his neck. No one has ever treated me like this before. Then I am happy to be the first. Chapter 6 Walking out of the hotel the next morning, Jennifer tied her bonnet ribbons under her chin, pausing to look around. The sun shone down, mild and warm, and a few townspeople who passed by smiled with pleasant greetings for her. A short distance away, Ron stood beside the hitched mules, absently stroking a mule's neck as he talked to a couple of local men. I don't want to interrupt, she thought. Deciding a short walk down the street would pass the time until Ron was ready to travel, Jennifer strolled along the pavement. Without a particular destination in mind, she enjoyed the atmosphere of a friendly town on a pleasant spring morning. Quick steps, the sound of boots on the wooden walk captured her attention, and she started to turn. The thought that Ron had seen her walk away and trotted to catch up to her flashed briefly through her mind, but a strong hand gripped her shoulder while a second seized the locket chain around her neck and yanked. A startled cry burst from her lips, and she stared at the tall man who now dangled her locket from his fingers. You! Christian Bates grinned and tipped his cowboy hat. Howdy, ma'am. What are you doing here? Give that back. What? This? It's a mighty pretty locket. He held it up to the sunlight. I'm thinking of keeping it. Anger flooded Jennifer. How dare you? That was my mother's. She tried to grab it from him, but Bates lifted it high and away from her reaching hand. I'm going to report this to the local sheriff, she snapped. You'll be arrested. No, I don't think that will happen, little girl, he replied easily. The lawman and I go way back. Plus, he owes me a favor or two. What do you want from me? Bates's cheerful grin turned feral, his eyes glittering like brown agates. You stole Lil Gloria from me. I think it's payback time. You had no right to demand she steal for you, Bates, Jennifer shot back. She has a right to live her own life. Now, I expect we disagree on that, little girl, he retorted. You owe me. I don't owe you anything, she hurled at him, nearly shouting. How did you come to be here anyway? I got off the train at Petersburg, he answered, smirking. Been following you. You're an evil man, Bates. I ain't. But I want to be fair. I'll tell you what. You and me have a little card game. You win, you get your precious locket back. Wary, 
Jennifer eyed him with suspicion. And if I lose? Oh, don't be worrying about that, he replied jovially, yet the hard glint never left his eyes. How much you got on you? Only a couple of dollars. We play, and all you risk is the locket and your few dollars. Your sweetheart down the way can afford to keep you in pretty dresses. Uncertain, Jennifer watched him carefully. Desperately needing the locket back, she knew she would do just about anything to get it. It had been her mother's, and her mother's before her. One game. That's all we need. Bates pulled a pack of cards from his coat pocket and shuffled them, watching her as closely as she watched him. He gestured toward a nearby bench. Have a seat, little girl. Perching gingerly on the edge, Jennifer never took her eyes from him, half expecting him to perhaps attack and kidnap her. Instead, Bates sat down, still shuffling the deck. At last, he dealt them out, five cards for each of them. Picking up her hand, Jennifer refused to let her dismay show on her face. Well, little girl? She discarded two, and Bates dealt her two more cards even as he smirked over his own hand. Jennifer wondered if the cards were marked, and another glance at his triumph told her they were. You're cheating, aren't you? She snapped, outraged. Me? Why would I do that? Because you're evil. Put your money out. Putting her cards face down on the bench, Jennifer opened her small handbag and took out the last few bills remaining to her. Bates eyed them. I reckon you weren't lying about no money. I'm not a thief and a liar like you. He grinned. How's your hand? Jennifer discarded one more and received another from the deck. She knew it was hopeless, for she had only a pair of twos, a three, a jack, and a queen. Your call. Bates set the locket down on the bills, then showed his hand. A full house. Jennifer glared. You cheated. The cards are marked, aren't they? He dared to look insulted. How about we try again? This time you deal. Winner takes all. The sound of briskly trotting hooves and the rattling of a wagon interrupted her biting comment before it emerged. Bates' eyes widened as he looked past her shoulder. In a lightning move, taking advantage of his distraction, Jennifer seized her locket and the money. She stepped back away from Bates, seeing his face turn a dark red in his fury. Stop right there! Ron's crisp voice and the cocking of the Winchester sounded at the same time. Bates froze, staring up at Ron in the seat of the wagon. This is between me and the Lil Lady, he snarled, his eyes narrowed. It ain't none of your business. I'm making it my business, Ron replied evenly. Jennifer? He stole my locket. She half turned to him, yet kept a wary eye on Bates. He was still close enough to grab her if he dared try. I'd make a very useful hostage. Retreating another few steps, she went on. He said if I won a game of cards, I could have it back. But he cheated. You calling me a cheat, woman? You're a cheat, a liar, and a horrible man. Get on up here, Jennifer, Ron ordered. His gun leveled at Bates' chest. Time to move on. Still keeping her eyes on Bates, Jennifer rounded the back of the wagon, then lifted her skirts to climb up to the seat beside Ron. Now you drive the mules while I keep my rifle on this scoundrel. That woman owes me, Bates roared, frustrated and enraged, his fists clenched. She took my gal. Jennifer doesn't owe you a red cent, Bates, Ron answered coldly. Neither did that little gal on the train. Now if I catch you tagging along behind us, well, next time I won't be so friendly. Slapping the reins on the mules' rumps, Jennifer encouraged them to start off at a trot. Ron swiveled his body to keep the Winchester trained on Bates, and when Jennifer shot a look over her shoulder, Bates stood in the street watching them go. Relaxing with a sigh, Ron lowered the rifle, then set it on the floor of the wagon. Here, I'll take those back. Jennifer handed him the reins. She put the money back in her bag, then examined the broken chain. I couldn't let him take this, Ron, she said slowly. It was my grandmother's, then my mother's. I can understand that. Ron turned his head to look at her, and Jennifer withered under his fierce, blue-eyed stare. But you shouldn't be taking on men like that. That's what I'm here for. You can't fight all my battles for me, she replied, meeting his angry gaze. No, I can't, he answered it. But that was one fight I should have been involved in. She chuckled. 
Actually, you were. So what are you mad about? He raked his fingers through his dark hair, blowing out a gust of breath. I don't know. I reckon that when I recognized Bates, I feared he was out to kidnap you or some such. That crossed my mind, too. Where'd he come from, anyhow? He said he'd gotten off the train at Petersburg, she replied, glancing back over her shoulder for any sign of Bates. The town had vanished behind a bend in the road. He's been following us. That means he has a horse. Ron frowned as he pondered. If he's out for his revenge, he may just follow us all the way to Mayhew. Wonderful. Now we'll be looking for him constantly and seeing him behind every bush. Maybe he'll get wise now, Ron suggested, and see I won't be pushed around, and he'll let you be. He might just decide it's time to head for greener pastures. I hope so. She caught the look he sent her from the corner of her eye. I'm hearing a button there. Excellent intuition. I'm afraid Bates might have become obsessed with me. If our conflict wasn't that serious, why get off the train when he did? Why follow us for the last three days? Pursing his lips, Ron nodded slowly. You're probably right. He might not be so willing to let things be. Chapter 7 How much farther is it to Mayhew? Jennifer asked. Ron ran some calculations in his head. We've covered maybe 40 miles over the last three days since we left Westbrook, he mused. I'm guessing at least another week on the road. He glanced at her, expecting her to find that timetable upsetting. But Jennifer's face maintained her serene and pleasant expression. She gazed over the sweeping prairie with its long grass and wildflowers. Hawks called to one another from high overhead while deer fled in panic from their presence. This is such a beautiful country, she commented. Indeed, fertile land for plowing, good grass for grazing. He gestured towards the now distant antelope. Plenty to hunt. I expect that folks will come west to settle this land one day. And that day isn't too far off, Ron replied. People have begun to settle further south in Nebraska, more in Oklahoma and Texas. Wagon trains have even been crossing through to get to Oregon or Santa Fe. It almost seems a shame to tame all this wild country. I expect that one day the buffalo will be sharing this grass with cattle. Ron had kept a watch for Bates on their trail ever since they left Westbrook, Missouri, but had not seen any sign of him. The land all around them remained quiet save for the chirping birds that flew up in startled flocks before settling back to the earth after they passed by. Yet he suspected Bates was clever enough to be sure he was not seen. Up ahead, the road curved around a small hillock with a few stunted trees at its base. Hoping the trees indicated a water source, he absently thought it was time to halt and rest the mules. There was shade under the trees, and if a stream flowed under them, he could offer them a drink of water. I could use one myself. I the team had reached the curve of the road with no sign of a stream or creek, but three riders galloped out from behind the hill, rifles pointed straight at them. Ron heard Jennifer gasp in shock as the wagon was surrounded in seconds. Hands up, mister, one ordered, a bandana covering the lower half of his face. Move and I'll shoot. Ron knew he'd have no time to reach for the Winchester at his feet before the three opened fire and gunned them both down. We have nothing, he said, his voice steady, raising his hands. You too, lady, the outlaw ordered. Jennifer obeyed, raising her hands up so they could be clearly seen. All I have is a few dollars, she told them. Take it and leave us in peace. Hand it over. Moving slowly, she picked up her small handbag, the precious locket safely in the pocket of her dress, and tossed it to the leader. He opened it, removed the money, then threw it back. Where's the rest? We spent it all on our goods, Ron answered. There is no more. One of the men rode closer to the wagon, standing in his stirrups to look into the wagon's bed. Nothing but bags and boxes in there, food, blankets, stuff like that. A sudden gunshot spooked the horses into quick leaps forward. The mules threw their heads up in a brief moment of panic. The outlaws spun their mounts around to face the new threat. The instant their backs were to Ron, he bent and lifted the Winchester to his shoulder. His first shot hit the outlaw leader in the leg. The man cried out in pain, then half turned to fire a shot at Ron from his six-shooter. 
The bullet struck the wagon's side, splintering the wood. Ron threw himself at Jennifer and tumbled them both over the side, the rifle still in his hand. Keep your head down, he ordered her, then popped up from behind the wagon's protection to fire another shot. A group of six riders galloped hard towards them over the prairie, firing their rifles at the raiders. The three, trying to control their half-panicked horses, fired back. Blood coursed down the bandit's leg where Ron's bullet was lodged, and he reined hard around to spur his horse behind the wagon. Ron cocked the Winchester, shot at him again, but missed. The leader fired his revolver twice in quick succession, the bullets striking the wagon's sides. Jennifer cried out in pain. Then the outlaw dug spurs into his horse's flanks and galloped away. His companions, yelling curses, followed him. Riding hard, even as the approaching group passed Ron and Jennifer by without stopping, pursuing the bandits with a vengeance. To his surprise, they were Native Americans. Their long black hair flowed in the wind, feathers tied into the strands. Painted symbols marked their horses, and several wore headbands to keep their hair from their eyes. Garbed in leather and carrying rifles, they paid Ron little attention. Ron crouched beside Jennifer. Are you all right? She lifted her right hand from the wound over her upper left arm. I think I've been shot. She tried to smile. Let me have a look. Blood had soaked her sleeve. He ripped the cloth open and examined the wound, relieved that it was not life-threatening. It looks like it grazed you, he commented. I don't believe it went through your arm. It sure feels like it. Sweat from pain dotted her brow under her bonnet and slipped down her temple. Jennifer's skin had paled, but she didn't appear to be in shock. Ron saw no blue tinge around her mouth that indicated she might faint or bleed to death. May I tear cloth from your petticoat? Jennifer laughed, a good sound. Sure, it's old and worn anyway. I'll buy you a new one. No, you won't. Lifting her skirt, Ron bared her petticoat and tore long strips from it. He bound her bleeding arm, listening to her hiss of pain. Sorry. Ron, those Indians are back. He tossed a glance over his shoulder. The Native Americans sat in their saddles in a line watching them. The rifles, still in their hands, were pointed up, the stocks set against their thighs. I think they might be on our side. Tying the bandage, Ron helped Jennifer to stand up. I'm going to have a talk with them. Be careful. Leaving her to lean against the wagon, Ron, still holding his rifle but pointed up as theirs were, took a few steps towards them. He spread his right hand outward in a token of peaceful intentions. We owe you our thanks. One of them nudged his horse towards Ron, then the others followed to flank him. For a long moment, he and Ron gazed at one another. The indigenous man had a strong face with a hooked nose, and his large dark eyes stayed impassive, unreadable. Those white men have raided our herds, he said at length, stolen our horses. I am Chief White Bear. I am Ronald Hawthorne, Ron replied, then gestured towards Jennifer. My companion is Jennifer Johnstone. I shot one of them in the leg. Good. If they come back, we must kill them. White Bear looked beyond Ron to Jennifer. She is wounded? The bullet grazed her arm. Turning to his companions, White Bear spoke in his language for a time, seemingly asking questions, receiving replies, discussing something. At last, he turned back to Ron. You may come with us. Our village is not far, and our healer will help your woman. Ron glanced back at Jennifer and observed her half-shrug and nod of agreement. We will come with you. Helping Jennifer back into the wagon, Ron set his rifle down, then climbed up himself. With the natives surrounding them, Ron guided the mules off the road and across the prairie to the north. White Bear rode his horse beside him, explaining further about the outlaws. They have not dared attack our village, he said, but I know they will grow bold and try. I did not think there were towns near here where they would sell your stolen horses. White Bear pointed south. There is a white village that way. Two days' ride. They would take our ponies there to sell. If the law catches them stealing horses, Ron commented, they will hang. The chief eyed him bleakly. If I catch them, they will face a far worse death than hanging. 
Well, I don't envy them that, Ron said with a grin. I do hope you catch them. We don't need their kind robbing folks and stealing horses. They make trouble between my people and the whites, White Bear added. We don't need that either. Jennifer did not speak much as they traveled with the natives and held her wounded arm cradled in her right. Ron grew concerned about her as she was clearly in pain and refused to complain about it. After an hour of traveling, the village appeared on the horizon. Warriors, women, even children gathered at the edge of it to watch their chief ride in with white people. They spoke amongst themselves in their language, some smiling, most not. Ron reined the mules in when White Bear halted, but his warriors trotted their mounts into the village before dismounting. White Bear gestured towards a couple of teepees. You may picket your animals. There is water behind the village. You will stay the night in safety. We both thank you for your generosity, Ron replied. I will bring the healer. Ron climbed down under the watchful gazes of the village Indians, then picked Jennifer up by her waist and set her beside the wagon. How's the arm? Not too good. Her face was damp with sweat. Tendrils of hair stuck to her neck. A quick inspection of her arm told him it had stopped bleeding. There's a log for you to sit on, he said, guiding her towards it. Sit there and rest. I am so thirsty. Ron helped her sit down, saying, I'll fill the canteens when I take the mules to water. He glanced at the still watching villagers, hearing them talk amongst themselves, but not understanding the language. I don't want to leave you alone. I don't think they mean us any harm. There just might be someone over yonder who doesn't like us white folks. Jennifer nodded. Ron unloaded their blankets and some food, then started to unhitch the mules. By the time he had finished, White Bear walked towards them with an old woman in a beaded leather skirt and a colorful cotton blouse. Her wrinkled face displayed a keen intelligence as her dark eyes sized them up. This is our medicine woman, Red Bead, White Bear told them. She is also my mother. Red Bead sat beside Jennifer and untied the bandage. Clearly it hurt her, but Jennifer stoically made no sound and gritted her teeth. Red Bead peeled away the bloody wrap, then spoke to White Bear. She says it is a deep wound, but will heal well. It is good I brought her here. Red Bead opened up the leather bag she had brought and took out a wooden bowl, some berries, herbs, dried leaves, and a small leather flask of water. She mixed it all together in the bowl, then smeared the mixture on Jennifer's arm. She turned her face away, her jaw tightened to stop herself from crying out. After that, she bound it with a thin leather wrapping and patted Jennifer's arm. She smiled broadly, showing few teeth in her gums, and said something to White Bear. She says you are welcome to our fires. Soon, we will offer you food and drink. Thank you for your hospitality, ma'am, Ron tipped his hat to her. Yes, thank you for helping me, Jennifer added. My arm feels better already. When White Bear relayed what they said to his mother, Red Bead nodded and beamed happily. She ambled away, then waved her arms at the villagers who were still watching them. Clearly, she berated them, for they soon went back to whatever they were doing when Ron and Jennifer's arrival interrupted them. I will take my animals to water if that's all right, Ron said to the chief. I will accompany you. Ron gave Jennifer a reassuring smile, then took the mule's lead ropes as well as their canteens. Walking beside White Bear, he asked, How is it you know English? I learned at the white men's mission, he replied. A few of my people also speak your tongue, but not many. The village had gone back to their activities, and there were others watering their horses at the creek. Ron squatted and filled the canteens while the mules sucked the water thirstily. This is a good place for your village, he commented, setting the canteens aside, then cupped water into his hands to also slake his thirst. We will be breaking camp to follow the buffalo soon, White Bear said. Jennifer nearly drained a canteen when Ron returned, gulping the cold water down as fast as she could. I really needed that, she said, putting the cap back on. I can tell, Ron replied as he picketed the mules where they could graze. He then set their blankets in the teepees and collected buffalo chips for fires. It will be cold again tonight, he commented, gazing at the sun setting in the west. Clear. Shortly after dark, a young man was sent to fetch them. He smiled cheerfully, beckoning to Ron and Jennifer. 
Jennifer seemed in less pain now and walked with Ron and the youth with firm strides. The boy indicated a fire where white bear and red beads sat, and they lowered themselves to the ground. Young women in blouses and skirts like red beads, their hair in braids, smiled shyly and brought them roasted buffalo, wild onions, and berries on wooden platters. As they ate the delicious food, White Bear told them stories of hunting and of battles with their enemies. He himself had counted many coups on his foes. So you don't always kill your enemies in a battle? Ron asked. No, as killing our enemy means they will kill us in revenge, White Bear said. By touching our enemy, we show our bravery. We do not waste lives for no reason. I wish my people would take up that custom, Ron replied, sharing a quick smile with Jennifer. We could learn a great deal from you. I fear the white men have closed minds and hearts, White Bear observed. Yes, you are right, my friend. Jennifer had removed the pins that bound her hair, and it tumbled down her shoulders and back. Ron noticed that he wasn't the only one who admired her beauty. He caught several young men looking at her and talking to one another, their expressions awed. He hid a smile, enjoying the way the flames danced across her face. One could fall in love. Maybe I am on my way. Chapter 8 Redbead said not to remove the bandage for three days. Jennifer sat on the wagon seat with Ron as he drove the mules towards the road the next morning. Her arm ached dully, but the fierce burning pain from the day before had greatly calmed. I wonder if there was something that kills pain in that mixture she used. It wouldn't surprise me at all, Ron replied. These people have lived close to the earth for centuries. It seems sensible to think they have learned a trick or two. I never knew very much about the Indian way of life, Jennifer mused, thinking back to the warm kindness the Native Americans had shown them the previous night. I think I could be happy living among them. Me too, Ron said with a grin. I don't know how well they'd take to the notion, though. I'd heard stories once about white people being adopted into tribes, she commented, gazing around at the never-ending green prairie. Birds chirped in panic as they flew up in clusters to escape the mule's hooves. Rabbits bolted into the long grass, and a large brown snake slithered across the road in front of them. I suppose that can happen, Ron agreed. Surreptitiously, Jennifer studied his profile, finding him more attractive than ever. Gazing again at the waving grass that stretched across the vast horizon, she knew she had fallen in love with him. How that had happened in a span of a week was beyond her, but it had happened. He is everything I ever wanted in a man, a husband. Kind, generous, humorous, courageous. But could it work? Could Ron love her in return? He had not advanced any further in his friendly attitude towards her, no indication he might take a romantic turn. Jennifer pondered his loss, the death of his wife. He might not be ready for a relationship so soon after his Helen died. You said there are employment possibilities in your town, she asked? For a woman with no husband? Ron glanced at her sidelong and smiled. Yes, and the lady who runs the boarding house is a very sweet lady. She looks at her tenants as though they were her children. Oh, that's very nice. Even if Ron could not return her feelings, at least Jennifer would have an income and a roof over her head. And Mayhew is a friendly town, accepting of strangers? Ron laughed. Most folks in Mayhew would be appalled to learn how we were treated in Petersburg. No one I know would offer insult to a stranger or be less than polite and respectful. Where I lived in Iowa, Jennifer went on, we considered strangers to be friends we hadn't got to know yet. That's how it is in Mayhew, Ron replied. Folks look after each other. If someone is in need, they'll pitch in to help. Always been that way. It's the way it should be. And my name carries a bit of weight in town. Jennifer's brows lifted in surprise. It does. Chuckling again, Ron blushed a faint red shade. Yeah, seems my folks were on the wealthy side, you know. My granddad came west with money and bought land, acre after acre. He was good to folks, employed some, raised his family. Now it's my turn to carry on, and I think I'm respected well enough that if I recommend you to an employer, he'll take you on. 
So that's why you keep telling me not to worry about money. Grinning sheepishly, Ron shrugged. I do have more than enough of it. The ranch is successful, brings in plenty more every year. The army needs beef, and I sell thousands of young stock at the market for good prices. Jennifer laughed. Even so, I don't want you to spend excessively on me. Well, since my back is getting sore from sleeping on the ground, he said with a wink, next town we come to, I'll be getting us rooms. Do you know how far away a town might be? She asked, thinking that a nice bed and a dinner at a table sounded wonderful. Old Chief White Bear said there was one a day's ride west, he answered. We're going about the same speed as a man on a horse, so we should come upon it later today. Ron, or White Bear, wasn't wrong. By late afternoon, a small town appeared on the horizon. Cattle grazed in the fields, watching them drive by with huge liquid eyes, still chewing grass or their cud. Cowboys on horses waved to them in a friendly fashion, and both Jennifer and Ron waved back. That's a good sign, she said with a grin. The townspeople watched them roll down the street with curious stares and no animosity. A few smiled as they passed by. Ron reined in the mules outside the four-story hotel, set the wagon's brake, and jumped down. Ever since she was wounded, he refused to simply assist her down. Now, he put his hands on her waist and gently lifted her down. I hope that is a sign of his growing feelings for me. Walking across the lobby of the inn, Jennifer felt dismay fill her when she saw the number of people within it. They sat in armchairs, on sofas, some chatting, others reading newspapers. This place might be full, she muttered as they approached the desk. That's a lot of travelers, he murmured back. I'm sorry, the woman behind the counter told them. We have only one room available. That's quite the crowd you've got here, Ron commented. Yes, we have many travelers at the moment, she answered. Most are on their way to Wichita. There's a big political to-do going on there in a few days. Jennifer glanced up at Ron, wondering what he'd suggest. Maybe we should camp outside town. If you don't mind sharing, he said, I'll stretch out on the floor. That's inappropriate, but I've slept within a few feet of him for nights now. He's been nothing but the perfect gentleman, so I hardly need be concerned about that suddenly changing. That hardly sounds comfortable. I want a roof over my head tonight, he told her and a meal that isn't cooked over a campfire. If the woman thought their sharing the room was inappropriate, she didn't reveal it through either word or expression. She took Ron's money and handed him a key. Supper is in an hour, she said, and a groom will care for your animals. The mules are tied up out front, Ron told her, then guided Jennifer towards the stairs. The room was clean and comfortable with a narrow bed, a table with a pewter pitcher filled with water and a chair. The window looked down upon the street below where men rode horses along it in both directions while wagons rolled slowly by. That floor doesn't look too hard, Ron said with a grin. I can sleep on the floor. Not with your arm, you're not. Whatever red bead put on it, it's working. She lifted her arm experimentally and felt some pain from the movement, yet it was a ghost compared to what it had been. I should be all right in a few days. Thus, I have the floor. He grinned suddenly. I love winning arguments. Hmm. Jennifer rested her hands on her hips, eyeing him with feigned annoyance. I had no idea that was an argument. I considered it a discussion. Either way, I won. Now I'll bring up our bags so we can change and wear something fresh for dinner. Now that's one of your better ideas. I reckon I'm just full of them. After he left... Jennifer wandered back to the window, gazing down into the dusty street. Not knowing the town's name, she did notice it was quite small for being on a well-traveled road. Sitting in the chair where she could still see out, her thoughts roamed to Gloria. I wonder how she is doing. The train should have arrived in Silver City, Utah, days ago. If all went well, she and Jason Tuttle should have married by now. Jennifer hoped for Gloria's sake that Jason was kind and would not just treat Gloria well, but actually love her. Gloria was pretty in her own right, and once she put on a little weight, could have a very pleasing figure. Of course, she was also a truly nice person, one whom Jennifer's grandfather would have called a good soul. 
Unpinning her hair, Jennifer let it down and stroked her fingers through its length, thinking, I will write a letter to her and hope and pray I didn't send her into a bad situation. The situation that should have been mine. Ron opened the door and carried in two satchels. You, milady, can have the room first, he said, placing both on the floor beside the bed. I want to go back down and check on our mules. Are you worried about them? Yes and no, Ron winked. Just me fussing, I reckon, needing to make certain all is well with the stock. I don't blame you, Jennifer answered with a smile. They're rather important for us right now. Back in a bit. After he left for the second time, Jennifer looked through her bag and selected a nice dress in shades of blue and gray. After removing her current gown, with the sleeves still torn and bloody, she washed in the basin. Feeling refreshed, she garbed herself in the clean dress and put the other away. At the first opportunity, I'll have to scrub and mend it. A knock at the door heralded Ron's return. I'm decent, she called. Ron entered and immediately looked her up and down with a grin. You most certainly are. Laughing, Jennifer said, just let me put my hair back up and then I'll meet you downstairs. Under his appreciative gaze, she coiled her hair up, then pinned it. Do I look presentable? More than presentable, Ron replied, taking her hand to his lips, kissing it. You are beautiful. Flushing under both his compliment and his admiring gaze, Jennifer smiled. She could count the compliments she'd received throughout her life on one hand. You are too kind, sir. I'm honest. That too. I'll see you downstairs. Until then. Leaving the small room, Jennifer walked down the stairs, feeling a giddy rush wash through her. It was something she had not felt since she was 13 years old and had an infatuation with a boy in her school. I really am falling in love with Ron, but are his feelings the same? The dining room rapidly filled with guests seating themselves at tables. Jennifer passed it by and walked to the front desk. The woman behind the counter looked up with a friendly smile. How may I help you? I would like to write a letter, Jennifer replied, returning the woman's warm expression. Do you have paper and a pen I may use? I do indeed. One moment, Maureen's authority. She went into the back and returned a few moments later with paper, an envelope, and a fountain pen. Here you are, ma'am. Just return the pen when you are finished. Thank you. I will. Taking the items into the dining room with her, Jennifer selected a small table with two chairs and sat down. A waiter brought glasses of water and set them on the table. She thanked him with a smile. After taking a moment to think, she started to write, My dear friend Gloria, I hope this letter finds you well. I have been concerned for your welfare since we parted company. Are you married now? Is Mr. Tuttle a kind and generous man who will be the sort of husband you want and truly deserve? Please write back to me in the care of Mayhew, Kansas Post Office, and I am certain it will find me. God bless you and keep you safe. Your friend, Jennifer Johnstone. After folding it, Jennifer set the letter aside and saw Ron entering the dining room. She had Mr. Tuttle's address memorized and wrote it on the envelope as Ron joined her. He had donned a clean shirt and added a jacket, and his hair was still damp from his wash. A letter? he asked, sitting down opposite her. Yes, Jennifer replied, inserting the letter into the envelope, then setting it aside with the pen. To the young lady on the train, I wrote to ask how she is doing. That's very sweet of you. Well, Jennifer began, unwilling to tell him that she was set to marry the man Gloria had probably wed in her place. I feel a little responsible for her. As though you were her older sister? Ron smiled. She was sure upset to see you go. I feel a kinship with her, yes, Jennifer answered, and of course I liked her right away when we met. You have no family, Ron asked. Is that right? Not since my grandfather passed away, Jennifer looked down at the letter. He was the last. I'm sorry. No one said life would be fair. She smiled without much humor. I miss him. And your folks? Though she expected the question sooner or later, Jennifer had hoped for later. Her mouth suddenly dry, she took a drink from the glass of water the waiter had brought to their table. They died right in front of me, she began, setting the glass back down. She had never liked to talk about her parents. It brought back too many harsh memories. I was ten years old. 
Ron frowned and reached across the table to take her hand. That's awful. What happened? There was a storm, she replied. A bad one. Rain and some hail to start with. Then the twister came. Oh, no. Ron grimaced as though he knew what she would say, his eyes sorrowful. My father saw it coming and ran to set the horses and cows loose, Jennifer said, then needed to wet her mouth again. He succeeded, but it came too fast. It caught him. Jennifer, you don't need to go on, he said gently, squeezing her hand. Yes, I do. Now that I've started. She drew a deep breath, then let it out slowly, but it did little to calm her nerves. It picked him up, and I could hear him screaming. My mother panicked, seeing him vanish into the swirling dust. She ran, maybe to try to rescue him. I don't know. I was standing by the house, crying, scared, and the twister took her, too. It would have taken me, also, if my grandfather hadn't grabbed me and taken me down to the root cellar. I've experienced twisters, Ron told her, his hand still on hers. One destroyed a barn, but I have never lost a loved one to them. The waiter brought them their dinner and set down plates of roast beef, potatoes covered in gravy, warm bread, and a side of green beans. After recounting her story, Jennifer had little appetite, but it returned the moment she tasted the hot beef spiced with flavors that teased her tongue. This is delicious, she exclaimed, cutting another bite. Well, I enjoy your campfire cooking, Ron said with a grin, devouring his own. I did need a change. As did I. Neither of them spoke much as they ate the wonderful meal. At last, Jennifer wiped her lips on her napkin and asked, How much farther to Mayhew? Ron wiped up the last of the gravy from his plate with his bread. Two days, three at the most. I hope Maggie got my wire explaining what happened to me. I'm sure she did. The waiter cleared their plates, then brought them coffee and pieces of a white cake for dessert. I'm almost too full for that, Jennifer commented with a smile. One can never be too full for cake. As she gazed into his warm, humorous eyes, Jennifer felt something flare between them. As though they shared an unspoken thought, a moment of complete understanding. For a brief moment, she felt a profound connection with him. Is this what it means to be in love? Chapter 9 Though he slept well enough, Ron's back still ached from sleeping on the floor. He said nothing to Jennifer, as he knew quite well she would feel bad for taking the bed. Stretching eased some of the kinks from it, however, and he counted himself lucky that the food at the hotel was excellent. Munching on crispy bacon, Ron said, There aren't any more towns between Hare and Mayhew. What do we need for supplies? We still have plenty of everything except meat, she answered enough to last more than three days of travel. Then I suggest we stop at the general store before we head out, he went on. We can try our luck at hunting, but we'd best not count on it. All right. As Jennifer packed their satchels after breakfast, Ron hitched the stout mules to the wagon. He drove them around to the front of the hotel and reined in. Jennifer emerged from the front doors with the satchels, but before Ron jumped down from the seat, a rider on a horse caught his attention. He stared. The man sat in his saddle and seemed to be watching them, but he was too far away for Ron to be certain, nor could he identify him. A large buckboard drawn by a team of big drafts rolled across the broad street, interfering with Ron's ability to see the fellow. When the buckboard cleared the road, the rider was gone. What's the matter? Ron shook his head. Jumping at shadows, I reckon. Down from the seat, he tossed their luggage into the back of the wagon, then helped Jennifer up. He glanced down the street once more, but again he saw nothing out of the ordinary. With an inward shrug, Ron climbed back up and slapped the heavy reins on the mule's rumps. At the general store, whose proprietor appeared happy to sell them what they needed, Ron purchased several pounds of dried beef and a smoked ham. Once their food was loaded into the wagon, Ron looked for the man on the horse again while helping Jennifer up into the seat, then kicked himself for being a fool. So tell me about your family, Jennifer said as they left the town behind and headed out across the open prairie. Do you have more than one sibling? For the moment. Ron offered her a bleak smile. My brother in Iowa is most likely dying. I went there on the train to visit him. I am so sorry. Me too. He's a decent enough fellow as far as brothers go. 
Ron crushed his growing feelings of remorse and grief at the thought of losing Tom. He never had much interest in the ranch or raising cattle. He went to law school and now is a lawyer in Des Moines. That's a worthy profession, Ron shrugged. I reckon, except our folks wanted us both to share the ranch and work it together. Tom had other ideas. What's your sister like? I think she's a lot like you. Ron grinned and winked, liking the way the early sunlight danced across her eyes. Tough, spirited, always manages to buffalo me into doing what she wants. Jennifer raised her brow. And I have you buffaloed? Not yet, but I'm sure you will. Your sister sounds like a good soul, Jennifer commented, looking out over the vast prairie and its long, waving grass. That she is, Ron agreed. Right pretty, too. Plenty of young bucks in town keep a lookout for her at dances. One day, I assume she'll pick one of them, then get married. But meanwhile, her big brother watches over her, growling at any male who shows too much interest in her. Jennifer chuckled. You got that right. My grandfather was like that. Jennifer sighed wistfully, overly protective sometimes, which is why I haven't married. Ron said nothing for a time, pondering that void in his heart that oddly seemed much smaller now. He missed Helen terribly and still grieved for her, yet despite that, he knew why his pain had lessened. On the train, he had felt he would never fall in love again, and he was wrong. Maybe in the end, that was a good thing, he murmured. He saw Jennifer turning her head from the corner of his eye, her mouth open, as though to ask him a question, perhaps to ask what he meant by that. Before she could, however, something, he was not quite sure what, forced him to look over his shoulder at the road behind them. A rider on a nearly black horse trotted along the road to their rear. Swearing under his breath, Ron handed the reins to Jennifer, then reached down to seize the Winchester rifle. She, too, turned, then muttered something that sounded like, Good Lord, is that Bates? Can't say for sure, Ron replied, grim. Could be any traveler going in the same direction as we are, but my gut doesn't like the situation at all. Nor does mine. What should we do? Right now, it's his call. Ron cradled the rifle in his arms, half turned on the seat to watch the rider. See what he does first. He didn't have to wait long. Once it became clear that Ron had seen him, the rider kicked his mount into a gallop. Drawing a pistol, he lifted it and fired around. The bullet missed them completely. Ron realized that Bates wasn't a good shot. Jennifer slapped the mules on the rumps with the reins, yelling, Get on there, hey yo! The mules broke into a gallop, the wagon jouncing over the rough road. Ron knew his own aim might be off considerably, but he lifted the Winchester to his shoulder and shot back. Bates could have caught up to them easily, as mules could never outrun a horse. Yet, inexplicably, he did not, and maintained his distance. Maybe he hopes to pick me off with that six-shooter. Taking advantage of the road smoothing out briefly, Ron fired again. He missed again. Oy, as their pursuer continued to gallop on their rear without any indication he'd been hit, Bates shot back, and this time his bullet buried itself in the back of the wagon. Now you're starting to annoy me, Ron growled, taking careful aim down the barrel of the Winchester. This time his shot hit Bates' horse. The animal stumbled, trying to keep its footing. Then it fell forward, throwing Bates clear from the saddle and onto the road. Continuing its forward momentum, the horse rolled over its own neck onto its back, then lay still. What happened? Jennifer cried, trying to look around. Got his horse, Ron replied, his voice grimly triumphant, yet with a pang of remorse, striking his heart. He hated to kill an innocent animal, even when he had no choice. Moderating his tone, he added, at least that'll teach him not to mess with us. Did Bates survive? she demanded. Ron peered intently into the rapidly receding distance. Yeah, he just stood up, but it's a long stroll back to town. Without being asked, Jennifer slowed the team down to a walk to give them a breather. Both mules snorted, getting their wind back, but had not worked up a heavy sweat. He'll keep coming after us, won't he? she asked. 
I reckon we'll have to expect it, Ron answered, still watching behind them as though anticipating Bates to conjure another mount and chase them again. I made him eat dirt, and he's not likely to forgive that any time soon. He shouldn't be chasing us anyway, Jennifer snapped, also looking back. Who does he think he is? I'm guessing he's gone from a simple bit of payback to a genuine obsession. Ron faced forward once again, but kept the Winchester in his arms. If he can kill me, he can get to you more easily. And do what? Doesn't he want to kill me too? I can't say, Jennifer, Ron answered, but back in Westbrook, he wanted to toy with you, torment you for a bit. He could have killed you right then and there'd be nothing I could have done about it, but he didn't. Jennifer watched him carefully, her lips thinned, her face tense. What does he want with me? I wish I knew, but I suspect he's not going to stop until he gets it. That evening, Ron picked a campsite near a rushing creek amid a small grove of thin poplar trees. As had become their habit, Ron cared for the mules while Jennifer built a fire and cooked their meal. He set out their blankets even though he did not plan to sleep that night. Estimating that Bates would need a few hours to walk back to the town, then buy or steal another horse, he could catch up to them easily if he pushed the horse hard. The mules hobbled where they could graze. Ron squatted by the fire as Jennifer fried ham with potatoes in the skillet. I'll keep watch tonight while you sleep. From across the fire, Jennifer gave him a narrow-eyed stare. That should be a shared task. Only one person is needed to watch, he protested. That's not what I meant, she replied, flipping the ham in the pan over with a fork. You wake me so I can watch, and you also get some sleep. Ron started to say that it was his job to protect her, but what she suggested made sense. I reckon I wouldn't be much use in a pinch if I didn't get some sleep, he admitted. I agree. Nor can we afford to have Bates creep up on us unaware, Jennifer continued. This way we both get some sleep. I can't imagine you trying to catch up on your rest by sleeping in the wagon during the day. I can guarantee I couldn't. Thus, after they ate their dinner, Jennifer lay down beside the fire, wrapped warmly in her blankets, while Ron took the rifle and walked several yards from the light. With his night vision at its peak, the moon and starlight enabled him to see fairly well, certainly enough to catch sight of anything moving towards them. Coyotes yipped in the distance as they announced the start of their hunt, and an owl soared across the sky, blocking out the stars for a brief instant. Ron followed its flight for as long as he could, listening to the light breeze through the grass and the tree branches. Occasionally pacing around the fire to watch and listen in all directions, he kept the craving for sleep at bay. As the hours passed slowly, the stars wheeling on their heavenly course, Ron pondered Christian Bates and his evident obsession with Jennifer. He understood revenge, the need to get back at someone who had done great wrong, but Jennifer only freed that young woman from his clutches, and she was not very important to him. When Ron finally woke Jennifer for her watch and handed her the rifle, he had come no closer to figuring Bates out or his motivations. He lay down by the fire and closed his eyes. I reckon I just don't understand obsession. Chapter 10 that road yonder leads to Mayhew, Ron said, gesturing. But this track here heads to the ranch. Jennifer shaded her eyes to see better, staring into the distance. Are we on your land? Ron grinned. Yep. Excitement coursed through her, swamping the exhaustion from constant travel and short rations of sleep. I can't wait to meet your son and your sister, she said. I can't wait to see them either, he replied. I'm glad you agreed to stay with us at the house. With Bates still out there looking to cause problems, she admitted, I would feel safer with you right now. Jennifer had originally thought to go straight to the Mayhew boarding house in town rather than stay at the ranch. Ron pointed out he couldn't protect her in town, and if Bates showed up, she was vulnerable. Despite her arguments that the sheriff could protect her, Ron eventually wore away all her objections. What if Bates doesn't know that is where you live? Jennifer asked. Could he possibly keep riding on past town? Ron shrugged. 
possible but unlikely. It would be better to hope that he learned his lesson in bothering us at all and wrote in any direction except this one. The last two days and three nights saw no hint at all of Bates, and Jennifer dared to hope exactly that. He had risked too much in following them or attempting to exact his revenge. Maybe he got wise to the fact that he can't intimidate or kill Ron, and Ron's presence with me means he can't harm me either. It took them more than an hour to traverse the distance to the ranch house. Jennifer saw herds of brown and white cattle grazing peacefully in the distance, the green grass bending under the mild wind. Birds flew up in cheeping clouds at their approach and settled back to earth after they had passed. This land in the west is incredibly rich and fertile, Ron explained. The grass regrows quickly after the cattle graze it down. I rotate pastures through the season, and there is still plenty of grazing left to keep them through the winter months. I imagine the winters in Kansas are similar to Iowa, Jennifer commented. Much cold and snow. And blizzards, Ron added with a quick shake of his head. My property contains bluffs that offer shelter from the worst of the weather. I remember stories from my granddad's days. Cattle buried to their necks in snow and ice, freezing to death in the thousands. I've heard tales like that in Iowa, Jennifer replied, though I didn't come from a ranching or a farming family. It can happen, Ron agreed. I just pray it won't happen in my lifetime. I can't imagine all those poor cows dying like that. At the top of a long, sloping hill, Ron reined in the mule and stopped the wagon. Below, a vast, shallow valley spread in front of them. A small lake fed by a sparking creek lay in the middle of it. Close by the creek stood a sprawling house, accompanied by a big barn, sheds, and corrals. Animals ambled around within the enclosures, but at this distance, Jennifer couldn't tell if they were horses or cattle. Home, Ron stated simply. It's beautiful. Stunned by its sweeping magnificence, Jennifer couldn't get enough of looking at it. As Ron encouraged the mules to continue on down the far side of the slope, she stared in wonder. I love that lake, Ron laughed. I spent many a summer swimming in it, escaping the heat. As they drew closer to the big ranch house, Jennifer felt her nervousness grow when two small figures stepped out onto the porch to watch their approach. Her mouth dried up, but Ron started to grin as the people waved wildly. I hope they like me, she murmured. Of course they will, Ron answered with a puzzled look in her direction. Dad! Nearing the porch, Ron reined the mules in just as the young boy leaped from the steps without touching them and ran to meet the wagon. Dad, I was so worried about you. The boy, David, looked a great deal like Ron, but with lighter colored hair. He had a slender build and the top of his head reached Ron's chest as the two embraced. He gazed up at his father with a grin, adoration clear in his gaze. I was worried about you too, Ron replied grinning back and ruffling David's hair. He gestured toward Jennifer. This is Miss Jennifer. She'll be staying with us for a while. Ron's sister also walked down the steps to greet him, yet her expression held no little anger and a great deal of relief. I'm so put out with you, Ronald, she snapped. You had us both scared silly. Why on earth didn't you stay on the train? But she hugged Ron as though never wanting to let him go. I'll explain. Maggie, this is Jennifer Johnstone. Jennifer, my sister, Maggie. A pleasure to meet you, Jennifer said, not waiting for Ron's assistance to get down from the wagon. She shook hands with Maggie, smiling, though she was slightly worried about the other woman's anger. I apologize for my outburst, Maggie said, glaring at Ron. I got his wire, but it was days ago, and every day I feared he had been killed. It certainly was an adventure, Ron said with a grin. How about we get all this into the house? Then David and I will leave you ladies to get acquainted while we put these tired mules in the corral. Unloading the wagon took very little time, and Maggie showed Jennifer to a guest room. As Ron had said, Maggie was very pretty with the same dark hair as her brother. About the same height as Jennifer, Maggie had a slightly stouter figure and a full bosom, and her skin had never been kissed by the sun. It remained as delicately pale as fine porcelain, the house was as beautiful on the inside as it was on the outside. Built from river rock and pine logs, 
It had a huge sitting room with a stone hearth and several bedrooms off the short hallways. Maggie gave her a short tour, showing her not just her room, but also the kitchen, three times the size of the one in her grandfather's house. Cowhides covered the wood floor and the furniture, and racks of antlers and antelope horns hung on the walls. This house is so grand, Jennifer commented, awed. My grandfather built it, Maggie told her with pride. The wood came all the way from the Rocky Mountains. That's incredible, Maggie caught her gaze. You are most welcome here, Jennifer, she said. Please forgive my forwardness, but do I see something going on between you and my brother? Jennifer flushed and shifted her eyes away. How did you know? He looks happy. Do you approve? Maggie took her hand with a laugh. Of course I do. Now come, let's get you settled. After she and Maggie unpacked Jennifer's belongings, all the while talking as though they had known each other for years, they went into the kitchen. I made a stew in the hopes that Ron and you would arrive today, Maggie explained. It should be ready soon. It smells delicious, Jennifer answered, her stomach rumbling. I'm so very tired of traveling. So what happened on the train? As Maggie made biscuits, insisting that Jennifer sit at the table and drink a cup of hot tea, Jennifer told her much of what had happened. She left out only the part where she was to marry Jason Tuttle in Utah and simply explained how she encouraged Gloria to get away from Bates. Maggie listened in astonishment as Jennifer explained now that Gloria was free of him. He had chosen to take his revenge on Jennifer. What an evil man, she said. Ron was right to have you stay here. You are much safer with us. I am thinking that Bates has given up and gone elsewhere, Jennifer said firmly. We saw nothing of him since Ron shot his horse out from under him. I do hope so. Ron and David came in after completing their chores, laughing and talking with happiness and excitement. David really took care of the place while I was gone, Ron commented with a proud grin. Yes, he did, Maggie agreed. I never had to remind him of his responsibilities. Ron's gaze met Jennifer's, and the warm expression in his eyes and on his lips gave her a tiny thrill, a delightful tingle along her skin. How did I fall in love with him so fast? Where will this go from here? If he felt the same as she did, she hoped he meant to have her live there at the ranch, then ask her to marry him. I reckon Jennifer told you of our adventures, Ron asked, sitting in a chair at the table. David sat at Jennifer's other side, gazing at her with almost the same worship as he offered his father. Are you going to live here, Miss Jennifer? Only long enough until I find work in town, she answered. Then I'll move into the boarding house. Disappointment filled the boy's face while Jennifer held her breath, waiting to see what Ron might say. She glanced at him to find similar disappointment on his countenance, along with a slight frown. That's something anyway. Maybe he's afraid that I don't share his feelings. We may actually have to start talking to one another about this. That will have to wait, Maggie said firmly into the strange silence, putting the biscuits in the oven. Miss Jennifer is clearly exhausted, and we just unpacked her things. She'll stay here for a while, recuperating. David smiled shyly. I hope you stay forever. I like you. Jennifer laughed. Why, I like you too, David. David, honey, please set the table, Maggie said, stirring the stew. And don't forget to wash your hands. You too, Ron. I can help, Jennifer began, rising. Maggie half turned and fixed her with a glower that had Jennifer sinking back into her chair. You will do no such thing. You are tired and bone thin. Tonight you eat and rest, and tomorrow you can help. The bed in the guest room was large, utterly comfortable, and Jennifer slept like a dead thing. If she dreamed, she did not remember it. Early morning sunlight streamed through the thin curtains, covering the window as she stretched lazily, yawning, guessing that Maggie, at least, was up. Based on the tantalizing odors of frying bacon teasing her nose, Jennifer rose from the bed. Leaving her hair in its thick braid she had put in before bed, she dressed in the blue and gray gown and examined the bandage on her arm. Planning to ask Maggie to help her remove it, she mentally planned to wash and mend the dress she had been shot in. Leaving it to lie on the bed, she opened her door and went into the kitchen. Good morning, she said, stifling another yawn.
Good morning, Maggie answered with a smile. Sleep well? I did indeed. Maggie cooked bacon on the stove, and Jennifer also recognized the scents of frying potatoes with onions and baking bread wafting from the oven. Will you help me with my bandage after breakfast? Of course. You still have it on. The medicine woman said to leave it on three days, Jennifer replied. It's now four. Ron and David are out feeding the stock, Maggie said. They'll be in soon. Then we can eat. Without letting herself overthink her question, Jennifer asked, Does Ron have feelings for me, Maggie? Maggie turned, the spatula in her hand. I believe so. As I said, I haven't seen him this happy since before Helen died. Why? Jennifer gazed at her hands on the table, her fingers entwined into a knot. I'm in love with him, and I'm frightened he doesn't feel the same. Resuming her cooking, Maggie spoke over her shoulder. I can see where that would be a problem. You haven't known him long, and he is still grieving for Helen. May I offer some advice? Please do. Give him time. Stay here for as long as you like, and see what happens between you two. Perhaps I should put some distance between us, Jennifer said, hating herself for the words, feeling pain spread through her heart. Live in town, get employment, give him time to overcome his grief. Gaining perspective never hurts, Maggie replied, but I suggest you stay until we know that fellow is truly gone. She turned suddenly and regarded Jennifer with a sharp gaze. You truly love him? With all my heart. Maggie said nothing more but smiled. Chapter 11 Though he needed to ride out and check on the cattle, Ron sat at the kitchen table with David, watching as Maggie bent over Jennifer's arm with scissors. With gentle fingers, Maggie cut the leather wrapping and pried away the stiffly dried salve Red Bead had smeared on the wound. Both Jennifer and Maggie wrinkled their noses at the odor, which Ron couldn't smell due to his distance away. I sure hope that isn't gangrene, Maggie muttered, throwing the leather and the balm out the door. I don't think so, Jennifer replied. I'd be in more pain, but the pain is subsiding. With a basin of warm water and a cloth, Maggie cleaned away the last of the salve and the remaining caked blood. Both women stared at the healthy pink hue of her upper arm, as well as the healing slash that marked where the bullet had cut her. Well, I'll be darned, Ron drawled, getting up to examine it closer. That old woman knew her stuff. She did indeed, Jennifer replied, grinning. I'll have a nasty scar, but my sleeves will always hide it. I'm going to put a new wrap on it, Maggie said. The flesh there is tender, and you could open the wound easily. Well then, Ron said, glancing at David, we're going to take a ride to check on the cattle. After lunch, would you like to go into town with me, Jennifer? Yes, I would. Ron very much liked the way she looked at him, as though she gazed at the most special man in the world, him. With that tiny half-smile creasing her lips, Jennifer almost seemed as though she were about to impart a secret. Maybe the secret is that she loves me. Ron hoped that was true, for he knew he had fallen headfirst in love with her. Let's go, David. Swinging into his saddle was like coming home all over again. Ron and David cantered easily from the yard, heading towards the vast herds of grazing cattle. He listened as David spoke of his own forays while Ron was gone, checking the herds and the fences, and reported nothing amiss as far as he could tell. You're growing up, son, Ron told him. At only eight years of age, you're coming into manhood. David blushed under his praise. I only did what you taught me. Also the sign of a man. I'm proud of you. Ron observed the cows nursing their spring babies, sagging the fence that David didn't have the strength to fix, the yearlings growing fat on the sweet grass. We should have a fine crop to sell at the market this autumn, he commented as they turned their horses' heads towards home. Can I come into town with you, Dad? David asked. Sure, why not? After lunch, the three of them rode into Mayhew, Jennifer refusing to spend any more time riding on the wagon. It feels good to ride a horse again, she said, with a happy and carefree grin. If I never see that wagon again, it'll be too soon. Ron had to concede. I think I might agree with you. Riding into Mayhew took half the time it would have with the wagon, and by two in the afternoon they dismounted in front of the general store. 
Tying their reins to the hitching post, Ron guided Jennifer and David towards the front door. Mr. Thompson might still want help in here, he said, his voice low. But remember, you don't have to do this. You can stay at the ranch for as long as you want. Had it been a cold winter, Ron could have warmed himself at the smile she sent him. Let's weigh all the options, she murmured. Then decide. Mr. Harold Thompson grinned widely from behind the counter as Ron, Jennifer, and David ambled through his door. Ron, he exclaimed, I heard you went to Iowa. Ron smiled and shook his hand. Just got back. This is Jennifer Johnstone, a very nice lady I met on the train. She would like to know if you still need help here in the store. Harold gazed at Jennifer with something akin to awe. Why, ma'am, I surely do. You appear educated. Can you write? Jennifer laughed. I can. I can also do sums, stock shelves, deal with customers by helping people purchase what they need, restock when new items come in, and I'm pretty good at cleaning. Harold leaned over the counter, his gaze avid. When can you start? When do you want me to? Ron felt no little disappointment when Harold hired her on the spot. While he understood that was what she wanted, to be independent, he also wanted her at the ranch. Can you give her a day or two to recover from the journey, Harold? He asked. It was a tough trip. Certainly, I can. His aged blue eyes glanced at Jennifer. As this is Thursday, why don't you start fresh on Monday morning? Mr. Thompson, I would be delighted to start Monday. Harold actually rubbed his hands together, laughing. Thank you so much for bringing this jewel in, Ron. David, how would you like some whorehound candy? I would like it very much, sir. As he escorted Jennifer around the town, introducing her to the people he had known for most of his life, Ron felt no little astonishment at how quickly his friends and acquaintances took to her. She was greeted with smiles, with good-natured humor, and many, many compliments. It almost seemed to him that the men coveted her while the women envied her, and yet she greeted them all with the same sweet, uncomplicated smile. Ron forced himself to steer her away from a pair of young cowboys who stared at her openly with clear greed in their eyes. They elbowed one another, their hats in their hands, grinning like fools as they each vied for Jennifer's attention and smile. Unbelievably, jealousy rose like a bitter-tasting posset in his mouth, and Ron slipped his arm through hers before the temptation to punch them in their noses came to fruition. How about we head on back, Ron suggested, glancing over his shoulder as the cowboys watched them depart. Their disappointment hung over them like a shroud, even as his triumph at defeating them surged within his heart. I suppose we should, Jennifer answered, and took the opportunity to lean in a bit closer to him. I really should help Maggie with supper. When she draped her hand over David's neck in affection, and Ron observed David's dazzling smile as he gazed up at her, Ron knew he had done the right thing. And I am in love with her. Against the odds, I found love again. I never thought it possible, but here she is, her arm through mine with my son, loving her as much as he loved his mother. Feeling freer, lighter than he had in a year, Ron rode beside her as they headed towards the ranch, listening to Jennifer and David's happy chatter. His son busily informed her of how he rode to check on the cattle every day while his dad was gone, helped his Aunt Maggie with chores, fed the horses, the pigs, the chickens, the milk cows. He assisted with the planting of the vegetable garden, shot a hungry coyote in search of a chicken dinner, and still had time to work on his reading skills every evening. I can help you with your reading, Jennifer said. I love to read. I'm trying to read a book Aunt Maggie gave me, David said, crestfallen. It's hard. Why is it hard? It's called Oliver Twist, and I can't understand it. Jennifer laughed, including Ron in her humor. I adore Charles Dickens, she declared. How about I start helping you this very night? David grinned. That would be neat. She is so smart, much smarter than I am. How can I compete for her love when everyone she meets loves her? I have no idea who Charles Dickens even is. Depression filled his soul that had just hours earlier soared with his love for her, and Ron suddenly doubted his ability to win her over. What would she want with a fellow like me? 
After supper, as Jennifer helped David with his reading and Maggie mended a rip in one of Jennifer's dresses, Ron sat in his favorite chair and watched the fire dance on the hearth. He listened as Jennifer explained just who Charles Dickens was, what he wrote, and why. Then, as David read aloud, encouraged him. You should be a school teacher, Ron remarked during a break in the reading. Jennifer laughed with one of her beautiful blushes that only made her prettier in his opinion. I love children, she admitted, but I lack a great deal in some subjects. Like what? Well, I can do adding and subtraction, she replied. I am terrible at fractions and am a horror in teaching civil government. So are all our state and federal politicians, Maggie added dryly, her needle flickering in the lamplight. Our beloved president could use a refresher course. Maggie, Ron admonished, laughing. What do women know of politics? She flashed him an impudent glance. More than you know or realize. I'm not sure women should meddle with politics, Ron commented dryly. Suddenly, he discovered both women's heads swiveled towards him, and twin sets of scowls were now directed at him. Ron gulped. You are a plum fool, Ronald Hawthorne, Maggie snapped. Women are equally suited for anything men can do. You boys simply refuse us the opportunity. I agree, Jennifer added. Give us the chance at an equal education, and we'll show you what our minds can do. Uh... I didn't mean for this to turn into a political argument, Ron said, defensive. Let's not get hot about this now, gals. Just you wait and see, brother mine, Maggie warned him. Women will one day become lawyers and become involved in government. Wisely, Ron merely nodded, not wanting to get Maggie riled over such an inconsequential thing. Jennifer returned to helping David with his reading, and he covertly watched the two together. David still grieved for his mother, but with the resiliency of children, he had recovered faster than Ron had. Look at them. David liked her instantly and quickly moved into loving her, and she's clearly very good with him and loves him back, even after such a short time. What does that mean? Beginning to believe that Jennifer fits so smoothly into his house and his life because she was meant to be there, Ron excused himself and headed for his room to sleep. But does she feel the same way I do? Chapter 13 Early Monday morning, Ron watched Jennifer ride for town on the first day of her new job. He had tried to talk her out of going, but she insisted. I gave my word, Ron, she had told him. I can't go back on it. Seeing her turn in the saddle and wave, Ron waved back, then sighed. A man is no better than his word, I reckon. That goes for women, too. When will she be back, Dad? David asked, also watching Jennifer ride away. This evening. Come on, we need to finish feeding, then get our breakfast. Maggie filled their plates with hot bacon, eggs, bread, and fried potatoes as Ron and David sat at the table. You need to give Jennifer her head, she advised, sitting down to her own meal. She's independent and needs to find her own way. I reckon, Ron replied, eating quickly so he and David could ride out and repair fences. She just doesn't have to. She feels that she does. Keep things in perspective for a while. Though he knew Maggie was right, Ron couldn't help but worry about Jennifer riding the miles to town by herself. He argued with himself that she was mounted on a solid horse and had a good head on her shoulders. If she ran into the trouble, she would most likely ride straight out of it. Even as he and David worked through the day, sweating as the summer grew closer, Ron continued to worry over Jennifer. Christian Bates had never turned up, but that didn't mean he wasn't lurking somewhere in hiding, biding his time. Still, Bates could have also moved on to other territories, and could even now be harassing some woman in Texas for all he knew. I think that'll do it, he commented, taking off his hat and wiping his forehead with his bandana. He eyed the long, silver lines of barbed wire stretching into the distance, satisfied they had done the job right. Let's head back. We'll grab a bite, then work on the barn repairs. Is Miss Jennifer going to stay with us, Dad? David asked, mounting his horse awkwardly, as the gelding was considerably bigger than he was. Right now, I don't know, son, Ron answered, mounting his own gelding. We'll have to see what happens. I really like her. David reined his horse's head around toward home. I want her to stay. I do, too. 
Jennifer enjoyed her work at the general store. Harold Thompson, an older gentleman with gray hair and grown children, could no longer keep up with the demands of his customers. Jennifer waited on those that came in, greeting them with a smile and suspected everyone in town had decided to drop in and see her. It's so nice to have a fresh face in here, said a stout matron named Mrs. Whitby. Old Harold is getting on in years, you know. Jennifer laughed. Yes, I did notice that. Harold was easy to get along with, and once he had shown her what to do, he left her alone to do it. When not waiting on customers, Jennifer cleaned, restocked the shelves, sorted goods in the back room, and assisted folks in loading their purchases into wagons. You work harder than ten people, Harold grumbled later in the day, but I only pay for one. Jennifer laughed and patted his grizzled cheek. Just wait until I ask for a raise in salary. I think I'm in trouble. The doorbell chimed, announcing another customer. Jennifer went to the counter as the man, who looked like a clerk with his visor and garters, approached. How can I help you? He smiled. I heard about the beautiful lady who came to work for this old geezer, he said cheerfully, earning a scowl from Harold. I'm John Simmons. Do you happen to be Miss Jennifer Johnstone? I am. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Simmons. He pulled an envelope from his pocket and set it on the counter. You have a letter, miss, so I thought to bring it to you and see your beauty for myself. You're too old for her, you old coot, Harold snapped. Sides, Ron Hawthorne is sweet on her. I didn't ask her to marry me now, did I? Jennifer laughed as they argued and inspected the letter. It was stamped from Utah, and the handwriting was thin and spidery. Both happiness and worry rose as she realized it was a reply from Gloria to her letter. She ripped it open and read the note. To my friend Jennifer, I am fine and I am now married. Jason is very good to me and I am happy. He's helping me write this letter so I will spell right. Thank you for letting me marry your man. If you had come instead of me, I know you would be happy too. Write me back and I will write you again. Your friend, Gloria Tuttle. Joy surged through Jennifer. How well did that work out? Happy that Gloria married a good man who would care for her. She slid the letter into her pocket, only half listening to the good-natured argument going on beside her. She smiled to herself, thinking of Gloria out there in Utah, happy, one day having children of her own. With Jennifer off in town working during the days, Ron continued his ranch work, their evenings together were pleasant, and Jennifer kept her promise to help David's reading. A strange contentment filled Ron as he watched them together, their heads bent over the book between them. We're almost a family now. Maybe it's high time to ask her to marry me. Returning home for lunch the following day, Ron left David at the barn to finish unsaddling his horse. He found Maggie in the kitchen with a strange expression on her face. Something wrong? he asked. I'm not sure, she replied. Jennifer received a letter from a friend of hers the other day. I found it in her room. Ron's brows rose. Why were you snooping? I wasn't. I didn't mean to, Maggie said, protesting. I saw it and thought it was something of mine, so before I knew it, I was reading it. And? Maggie sat down at the table, watching him carefully. She was supposed to marry someone, Ron. Her friend Gloria married him instead. Her soft words struck him like a hard fist to his chest. He stared. What? Gloria wrote, Thank you for letting me marry your man. Ron, what is Jennifer doing? I have no idea. But his appetite had disappeared. Jennifer already had a man and yet sent Gloria off to marry him? What nonsense is this? His rage grew as he thought of how Jennifer had tricked him, letting him believe that she had sent her friend into a new life free of baits. Maybe she had, but why didn't she tell him about it? Why keep it a secret? His jangled thoughts bothered him all afternoon, and his anger refused to depart. David avoided him, performing his work as far away from Ron as he could get. Ron rarely got angry, but his jealousy rode him like a night hag and his temper soared. Why didn't Jennifer tell me there was another man in her life? Nothing made sense. His fury mounted as Jennifer trotted her borrowed horse into the yard and he stalked forward to meet her. Maggie also stepped onto the porch while David watched from a safe distance. 
Jennifer's beautiful face smiled, happy, and she dismounted as Ron strode up, but her grin faded as she caught his expression. Ron, what's wrong? You tell me, he snapped, unable to keep his voice down. What are you talking about? When I didn't tell you. Taking off his hat, he ran his fingers through his hair, fighting to hold on to his temper. We found a letter from Gloria, he growled. She went to Utah to marry your man. Your man? Jennifer. You were already in a relationship, and then I fell in love with you? As he spoke, Jennifer's expression grew tight. Her lips thinned as her eyes sparked with her own growing anger. So the word privacy matters little here, I see, she said, her voice thick with anger. She shot a dark look towards Maggie. That was none of your business, either of you. None of my business? That you were to marry another man? A man I had never met, she snarled, her knuckles white on the reins. I was a mail-order bride, and on the train towards the man I thought would be my future husband, I got scared. I didn't want to marry a stranger, someone I had never laid eyes on before. I felt trapped. Gloria was desperate to be free of Bates and wanted to marry, so I gave her Mr. Tuttle's letters and sent her to marry him in place of me. Jennifer glared at Maggie who now stared at the porch floor, her face flaming red. As you see, it was a good choice. Gloria got what she needed, a good man. She's happy, but I'm the one who paid the price for her happiness. Ron felt his anger ebb, but still couldn't understand why Jennifer didn't tell him about this Tuttle in Utah. So you decided to keep it a secret, he continued, his voice grating. I don't much like secrets, Jennifer. Makes me wonder what else you're keeping a secret. If I am, it's for a good reason. I think you should go away for a while, he said, staring into her furious eyes. He dug money from his pocket and handed it to her. Stay at the hotel. I don't need it, she growled. I won't be back. I'll send for my things later. She threw the horse's reins at Ron, and he caught them by surprise. I'll walk into town. Good day to you both. Whirling around, Jennifer strode from the yard and down the road that led into town. Ron watched her go, slightly stunned at how quickly everything had spiraled out of control. When she was lost from his sight, he found Maggie beside him. We did that woman wrong, Maggie said, her voice low. She's right to have kept her silence. It was none of our business if she was to have married a man she never met and decided not to. I should never have read her letter. She should have told me, Ron growled. Why? It was none of your business. Now, because of me and you being jealous, she's gone. She loves you, Ron, and you're just going to let her go? Uneasy, the last bit of his anger dribbling away, Ron stared in the direction Jennifer had vanished into. Maybe we need to just cool off. No, you get on that horse and go get her back. Tell her you're sorry and beg her forgiveness. Finally realizing that Maggie was right and that he had blown it all out of proportion, he still stood there. I don't know what to do, he said, feeling lame and an utter fool. What if she won't listen? Maggie shoved him. You are going to try. Now go get her. Swinging up into the saddle, Ron reined the gelding around and kicked him into a canter. She can't have gone far. She should be right there on the road. But Jennifer was nowhere to be found. Chapter 14 Her fury riding high, Jennifer stormed down the road. How dare he question my honor, she seethed. Just who is he to demand I tell him my every secret and to be reading my mail? Now that's just low. Knowing it would take her more than an hour to get to town, Jennifer was determined to get there before dark. I'll stay in the hotel, she snapped, and the boarding house later. You've seen the last of me, Ronald Hawthorne. When she heard the sound of a horse cantering behind her, Jennifer suspected Ron now rode to apologize. That won't work as I'm done with you. I never should have come all the way here with you. There were plenty of towns I could have taken up residence in. Planning to give him a thorough tongue lashing, when he caught up to her, she didn't bother to turn around as the horse slowed to a trot, then a walk at her side. But when the strong hand reached down and grabbed her under the arm and lifted her, Jennifer squawked in surprise. Only when she sat across the rider's lap did she see his face. Christian Bates gazed down at her with a grin. Look at you, stomping down the road in a fit. 
too shocked to struggle at first, Jennifer gaped. What? You... Yep, it's me, little gal. Did you miss me? Lifting her hand, Jennifer slapped him across his face. Let me go, you scoundrel! His face dark with anger, Bates gripped her striking arm in his hand, then kicked his horse into a gallop. Now you want to quit that, Missy, he snapped, holding her tight against him. I don't want to hurt you. Jennifer struggled and kicked, trying to escape the solid grip he held her in. Let me go, she howled. Not yet, little girl, he growled. You cost me Gloria, so now your rich friend can pay me back for her. I bet you're worth a thousand dollars. I'm worth nothing to that dog, she snapped. If you don't pay up, Bates said with a grin, then you'll be working for me until your debt is paid. Discovering that fighting him only made her exhausted, Jennifer ceased her struggles. I will do nothing of the sort. Of course you will. You got no choice. Settling down to plan her escape from Bates, Jennifer watched the passing countryside and thought furiously. As she didn't expect Ron to help her, she would have to find a way to get away from Bates, then find the town's sheriff. When Bates was arrested, then she'd finally be free of him. I must escape. Somehow I will, and Bates will regret his decision to chase me halfway across the country. Oddly, she felt little fear, only anger. Bates hadn't threatened to harm her, and his manner towards her was more businesslike than evil, as though she was worth more alive to him than dead. I am, if he thinks Ron will ransom me, which he won't. He's no doubt back at the house, happily eating dinner. Bates slowed the horse when they drew closer to Mayhew, but didn't lessen his grip on her. Where are you taking me? she demanded. A house I know of, he replied. It's empty. Then I'll send a message to your man. He'll pay up. Jennifer thought to inform him that she and Ron were through, when, without any warning, something heavy struck Bates from the rear with a flat thud. A rock tumbled to the ground at the horse's feet. Bates grunted, and suddenly both Jennifer and Bates fell from the horse. Jennifer struck the ground hard, Bates on top of her legs. Unable to understand what had happened, she kicked free of him, just as he also sought to rise. A horse galloped in close, and a man flung himself from the saddle. Jennifer had a brief instant to recognize Ron before she rolled away from Bates, freeing herself, escaping the fight between the two men. Sitting on the ground, amazed, Jennifer watched as Ron slammed his fist into Bates' jaw, knocking him back. Bates floundered on the ground, and Ron grabbed him by his jacket, yanking him up. You think you can steal my woman? Ron yelled, then hit Bates hard in the gut. Bates grunted, his lower lip bleeding. I'm sorry, he tried to say. Ron hit him again, then let him drop to the ground. Bates curled up into a ball, holding his stomach and groaning as Ron lifted him again, then gave him a solid blow to his jaw, knocking Bates out cold. Jennifer stared as Ron, breathing hard, stood over Bates' still form. Then Ron turned. Jennifer, he began, I'm so sorry. I was wrong to accuse you of anything bad. You have a right to your secrets, and I am sorry. Please, will you forgive me? As he knelt by her side, Jennifer felt her anger wash away. He came for her. Against the odds, he had come for her. His eyes told her more than his words that he was truly sorry for hurting her. He really means it. She pressed her palm to his cheek, smiling. I should have told you the true reason I was on that train in the first place, Ron, she admitted. I just didn't think it was important. Turning his head, Ron kissed her hand. It's not important. It never was. I love you. I want to marry you. Tears stung her eyes. You do? I do, more than anything. Jennifer, will you marry me? Joy sang in her heart, coursed through her veins. Flinging her arms around him, she laughed, crying, holding him tightly to her. Yes, Ron, I love you. I want to marry you. Pushing her away enough so he could kiss her, Ron did exactly that, then kissed her cheeks, her tears. I'm so sorry, he murmured, their foreheads touching. I was so stupid. It's all right, you're here now. Rising, Ron lifted her to her feet, but kept his arm around her shoulders. He glanced down at Bates. I suppose we should turn him into the sheriff. He tried to kidnap you. Maybe he's wanted for other crimes, 
Jennifer suggested, wiping her tears away. Think there might be a reward for him? Ron laughed. If there is, it's all yours. You caught him. But you did the hard work. I think there's some rope in that saddlebag. We'd better tie him up. Before he reached for it, Jennifer grabbed his hand, gazing up into his face. I have no other secrets, Ron. I love you. Even if you did, he replied, taking her in his arms for a long kiss that left her nearly breathless. I have no right to them. I love you too much to risk losing you again. Read a doctor to brighten her darkest hour now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.